will put them alone at the top of the AFC Central Division. The Dolphins are led by their record-shattering quarterback Dan Marino, while the Browns are guided by a young and ever-improving Bernie Kosar. And in spite of Miami's 4-5 and five record, Marino is tied for the league lead in touchdowns and is ranked as the number one NFL quarterback of all time. His two wide receivers, Mark Clayton and Mark Duper, are swift, they're acrobatic, and a threat to score from any spot on the field. The coach Don Shula's problems lie principally with his defense. The Dolphins rank near the NFL bottom against the run and have time and time again given up the key reception with the game on the line. Tonight, the Browns will test that defense with 22-year-old Bernie Kosar. Kosar is in his second full season with the Browns and aided by Ozzie Newsom, Cleveland's all-time leading receiver. The Browns have developed an improving passing attack that could help them take the lead in their division tonight. Kozar, the All-American from Miami, is a native of Ohio, and he has helped to pack Cleveland Stadium tonight with 80,000 fans. The Cleveland Browns and the Miami Dolphins on ABC's NFL Monday Night Football. On third down and eight, Gilliam back. Good protection. Oh, and it's picked off. Anderson. Dick Anderson. Dick Anderson touchdown. And did he read that beautifully? Short yardage set by the Cleveland Browns. Sight on third and one. Looking for Greg Pruitt. And he was picked up by the Cowboys. He's going deep to Nusa. from Cleveland Stadium in Cleveland, Ohio. On a very chilly evening, a sellout crowd of 80,000 is expected for the Miami Dolphins and the Cleveland Browns. Our ABC Sports exclusive is brought to you by Buick and your Buick dealers, where better really matters. And by Miller Highlight. Miller made the American way since 1855. And by the U.S. Marines, who today, on their 211th birthday, still say, we're looking for a few good men. And by After Plus from Gillette, the essence of shaving. Hello again, everyone. I'm Frank Gifford, and indeed, welcome to Cleveland. Not only a chilly night, it could become a very cold night, and it could get sloppy later on. We hope we can bring you a top-flight football game tonight. Much is on the line for both the Cleveland Browns and the Miami Dolphins. Cleveland with an opportunity to go one up on Cincinnati in their AFC Central Division, and for Miami, any aspirations they might have to get to the playoffs this year could disappear with a loss tonight. The Dolphins, of course, still have a high-powered offense. We know that because... They ran off 45 points against the Jets, but they lost 51 to 45. This is the man who pulls it all together for them. He is the all-time NFL leading quarterback in the history of the game. Where the Dolphins and Don Shula are really troubled has been on their defense. Their defense has struggled. They're number 27 going into this 10th game of the season, but they have been able to come up with a fine rookie fine in John Offerdahl. We'll see a lot of him tonight. We'll be talking to him a lot. But they need to improve defensively. They have over the past couple of games. They got off to a one and four start, but they have won three of their last four games. And Don Shuley is talking very cautiously uh, and saying that we have indeed improved. But we will get the thorough test tonight. And when we think about a thorough test, we think about a Cleveland Browns team that is really coming on and a Cleveland Browns team that could be uh, inspired, Al Michaels, because... If they get by tonight, there'll be one game up, and that schedule for them looks pretty good down the line. And they've been hot, and they have won five out of six. And as you mentioned, Frank, they do have an easier schedule, certainly far easier than the Cincinnati Bengals the rest of the season. The Browns are an interesting team in as much as they are six and three, and yet they have been outgained in eight of the nine games thus far. So how have they done it? Last year, they had 2,000-yard rushers. This year, Miner is hurt. Mack is on the mend, and he is subpar, and they've been using Curtis Dickey a lot, and their ground game, it all has been below average. Then there's Bernie Kozar. He's not having a spectacular season. He's improving. He is still very young, still shy of his 23rd birthday, but he's been functional, and he's helped lead Cleveland to six victories in nine games. But what's really made the difference for the Browns 
has been the special teams unit. They have run a punt back for a touchdown this season. They've run a kickoff back, and they have blocked two punts and turned those into touchdowns, and that has made the difference. They've been winning, and they've been winning the close ones. They've won four of their six games by three points, and so Marty Schottenheimer and the Cleveland Browns with a chance to move on top all alone in the We're AFC Central. A game in front of Cincinnati is the Bengals, as you know, were upset yesterday by Houston. So there is Schottenheimer and the special teams as they get ready to come out onto the field and they'll be kicking off to the Miami Dolphins. You had a quick look at Bill Cower. He is a special teams coach and he is an excitable one. As we look at Don Shula, now in his 24th year as a head coach, 17 with Miami. What a marvelous record he has put together. In 13 of the past 16 years, Don Shula's team has either won the division outright or they've tied for it. This year, they are indeed struggling. Sellout crowd at Cleveland Stadium. It is a very chilly night. The temperature is near freezing, low 30s, but it's been cleared. It was a clear day, clouded up near sunset, and they say the possibility of snow showers exists in about three hours. Craig Ellis and Ron Davenport are back to receive. And what's interesting is that Cleveland winning the toss of the coin but not electing to receive. They'll kick off as Barr puts it in the air and it's fielded at the 14 and dropped there by Davenport. And he then brings it out to the 25-yard line. And thus Dan Marino to lead the Miami offense. Marino coming off a game in which he threw for four touchdowns last week against Houston in a 28-7 victory. And the men with him, Lorenzo Hampton in his second year has taken over for Tony Nathan. And then there's Woody Bennett that we'll see a lot of Davenport. The great wide out Stooper and Clayton and Hardy is the tight end. And the line anchored by the man in the middle, the pro bowler Dwight Stevenson, 57. First down Miami from the 26, and Marino goes to the air, and wide open at the 41 is Bruce Hardy. So the tight end goes right down the middle, and Chris Rockins, the free safety 37, who is taking the spot occupied by the late Don Rogers, makes the tackle. Camp, Golick, and Hairston when they have a three-man line, with Banks, Johnson, Griggs, and Matthews, the four backers, and the two great corners, Minifield and Dixon, with Ellis and Rockins. Great matchups tonight. The two cornerbacks, Minifield, Dixon against Cooper and Clayton. They'll be at it all night. And Davenport and Bennett are the two backs, so they have the two big backs in, and it's Davenport who takes it for a gain of five to the 46-yard line. So a little different twist here from Shula at the outset with the two big backs. This is Duper working against Hanford Dixon, and this is an aggressive football team particularly at the corners, Dixon and Miniford. Look at Dixon play off Duper, read the run, move back up to make the stop. And we saw early Marino going right to Bruce Hardy as tight end. We'll see him continue to do that as long as they're going to give us double coverage or any kind of technical coverage. That is with the middleman coming over to help out on the outside. We'll see him going to the tight end, also to Hampton or Tony Nathan out of the backfield. On second down and six, Marino stepping up, throwing on the run, and incomplete. It would have been a first down intended for Mark Clayton. What we don't have tonight are two running quarterbacks, I can assure you of that. Marino doesn't like to scamper out of that pocket. Shula doesn't like to see him come out of it, and we'll see little or none of that from Bernie Kozar. Third down and six now. And the Browns with six defensive backs. We played a minute 35. And for the Dolphins, James Pruitt in the game, and he is wide to the right. And that's Nat Moore who lines up in the backfield at what would be left half. And they send him out into the pattern on third and six, and the throw is incomplete intended for Nat Moore. Chris Rockins was covering, and the crowd comes alive immediately as the Browns will be getting the football. It was good coverage. It was read properly by Marino. He picked the man who had single coverage. It will be Duper working against Hanford Dixon. Now, he basically is man for man, but he gets help on the inside from the free safety. And there he is right there with him all the way. He'll give him a little pat now. 
it's kind of a friendly little duel, if you will. But Marino read it right, went to the right receiver. He just didn't hit him, and it brings up fourth down. Reggie Roby to kick, and back to receive is Gerald McNeil, who is only 5'7 and 143 pounds. It's a short kick, and McNeil feels it on the run at the 16 or at the 26, and is dropped at the 27-yard line by David Fry. And thus the Browns take over with 13-12 to go in the first quarter. Bernie Kozar, who has been the number one quarterback this season all the way. Mike Pago has yet to throw a pass, and he's number two, and Gary Danielson is hurt. And he has Curtis Dickey and Kevin Mack in the backfield with him. Reggie Langhorn and the rookie Webster Slaughter and the great tight end Ozzie Newsom. And then the men up front, where they're missing Ricky Bolden, the left tackle who's out with a broken arm. Dickey lines up in the slot to the left. And on first down from the 26-yard line, it's Kozar right to the air, throwing complete. And close to the first down, Reggie Langhorn, and he has the first down out of the 38-yard line. Three-man front, Turner Baumhauer making a comeback from knee surgery and little. Then Brzezinski, Ship, the good-looking rookie Offerdahl, and Brown, who's moved from inside backer to outside. And then Langford and Judson, who has the flu at the corners, and Glenn Blackwood and Bud Brown, who alternates with Donovan Rose at safety. Brian Brennan is set wide to the right on first and 10 from the 38-yard line. And Brennan goes in motion off the play fake to Dickey. Kozar throws. Nice catch by Kevin Mack. Back to the 30, to the 20, and the last man gets him at the 15-yard line. Kevin Mack ridden down by Blackwood. Kozar brings 80,000 fans to the feet. You'll see it from the reverse angle. Kozar gets good protection. Releases it right in between the zone. Splits two men. Does Kevin Mack. And Mack playing with a very sore shoulder. He's missed four games this season. Takes it all the way down to the 17-yard line. He beats Brzezinski. And Blackwood saves the touchdown. First and 10 Cleveland at the Miami 17. Pass made at the 10 by Webster Slaughter. And Webster Slaughter hit by Mark Brown. And it's Brown who comes up with it. And now they'll discuss it. As the referee, Gene Barth, will give us the call. According to the new fumble rule, as the offensive team fumbles the ball out of bounds through the end zone, the ball belongs to the defensive team. First down, where they fumble the ball. New rule in effect in 1986 for the first time, as defined here and explained by Bart. Look at it again. The Browns come out firing. They haven't run the football yet against the team ranked 27. Here he is to slaughter. And Slaughter tries to get away. The ball banged out of there by Mark Brown, knew exactly what he was doing. And Miami gets a big break. Surprisingly, to me now, Cleveland came out, has not run the football yet. Four straight passing plays, all of them successful. Under the old ruling, it would have been a touchback. It would have come out to the 20 yard line instead from the four. Marino gives the ball to Hampton, and he won't give them any extra breathing room as he is stopped. At the two and a half by Chip Banks, number 56. Chip Banks missed all of training camp, but he is back to where he was playing a year ago, Pro Bowl style linebacking. Great linebackers here for the Cleveland Browns. Eddie Johnson has really come on in the middle. Clay Matthews playing a little bit hurt on the other outside of the Browns 3 4, basic 3 4 defense, although they've been using a lot of 4 3. They have good linebackers. Second and 11. As Marino looks for Clayton, and he's covered well on the play. Back with him, step for step, was Frank Minifield. And it will be third and 11 from the two. 
Menifield and Clayton were teammates at Louisville. And it was interesting in the playoff game a year ago, there was only one pass caught between the two marks, Duper and Clayton, against Menifield and Hanford Dixon. That time, Marino, with a little bit of pressure, had he been able to lead it inside, he perhaps could have got the ball to Clayton. But even though they looked man for man, Minifield and Dixon, in almost every occasion, particularly against Clayton and Duper, they're going to have help on the inside from someone, usually the free safety. Now, Duper and Moore wide left, Pruitt and Clayton wide to the right, and they give it to Tony Nathan, the sole running back, to try to give them some breathing room and create some space for Reggie Roby. Sam Clancy, 91, makes the tackle, and in comes Roby to punt with 11 minutes to play in the first quarter. Crowd really into it early. They know the Browns have a chance to take over first place in their division. Reggie Roby can boom it out of there as Gerald McNeil drops to Cleveland. He can frighten you, Al. He can move that football. They call him the Ice Cube. He was so named by the punter Jeff Gossett in training camp when he saw how slithery a stray ice cube was on the table. It reminded him of McNeil, Ooh. and McNeil has reminded a few opposing special teams of a slithery returner, but not here on a booming punt that Spear caught after a 49-yard kick by Roby. And from all of us at ABC Sports, happy birthday on this 211th birthday for the Marines, particularly from this former PLC -er at USC. Happy birthday, Marines. And also to Doit W. Acom Jr., a master sergeant who's watching this game out in Okinawa tonight. You'll do anything not to get drafted. <laughs> Browns at their own 46-yard line, first and 10. And with Ozzie Newsom in motion, they'll throw their fifth consecutive pass and it's completed for 42 for a first down. And in the middle of the pile is Reggie Langhorn, number 88. In his second year out of Elizabeth City State. And a fine catch as Langhorn comes down to it. Drives it upfield, turns to the inside. Forces the defensive back back. It collapses in on him, but it is surprising. The Browns coming out against the team ranked 27th out of 28th teams in the NFL against the pass and they have not run the ball yet. That could be perhaps because of the sore shoulder of Kevin Mack and of course Ernest Beiner, their other thousand yarder from a year ago is on the injured reserve. Brennan in motion from the 42 yard line and on a roll, another pass to Newsom and he has a first down. 31 yard line. Ozzie's been bothered by a bad shoulder, and that's limited his numbers this season. As you can see, just 20 catches in nine games. Very un -Newsome like but the injuries have been a big factor. Here's something, though. He hasn't missed a football game, and they tried to keep him out of one here at Cleveland earlier in the year because of the shoulder and the ankle since he was back in the ninth grade. All-time Browns leading receiver, and this is like shooting ducks for Kozar. Bernie hasn't missed yet. First down from the 30-yard line. Now they keep it on the ground, and Dickey goes nowhere. So Cleveland coming out and trying to exploit the Miami defense, and that's something a lot of teams have done. They used to be the killer bees. They used to be the no-name defense, but for the most part this season, they've been the no defense. Now they're getting back to the no-name defense, too. D.J. Turner, a rookie, opening a defensive... And ahead of Doug Betters has all season. George Little over the right side. Bob Bama are now working back in the shape at the nose tackle. They've had a lot of injury problems. Mack and Dickey, the running backs. And on second and eight, Kozar puts it out. And it's complete to Kevin Mack. And he takes it to the 15-yard line. And the Browns moving again as easily as they did on that first drive, which ended on Slaughter's fumble through the end zone. 14-yard pickup here. Browns at the Miami 15. Marty Schottenheimer. Former assistant coach with the Giants back in 77. Brought in a new offensive coordinator, Lindy Infanti, who was with him at the time back to the Giants. They had also coached Cincinnati in the year that they went to the Super Bowl. But it's a new Cleveland Browns offense. 
Newsom in motion. Kozar again to the air. Throwing wide open and incomplete through the hands of Webster Slaughter, who was wide, wide open. Falling down on the play in the end zone was Judson. Shaking his head, though. He knew he should have had it. Bernie Kozar knows he should have had it. Might have had a little too much on it because he was so wide open. He could have taken a little bit off. Good move by Slaughter, the rookie from San Diego State. Little drive downfield. Wide open. Just that's lost the concentration because it was coming in there so beautifully. Still no score. 8.07 to go first quarter. And Kozar, with things going so swimmingly, has to take a timeout. So the Browns spend the timeout with 8.07 to go in the first quarter. Cleveland's been moving, but still the game is scoreless. Bernie Kozar has already thrown for over 100 yards against this highly suspect Miami defense. He's 6 out of 7, and the only miss was the dropped pass. That Le pass caught in the... Fumble taken away, and we could have a 14 to zip ball game, but still there are no points on the board. Second and 10, that's Dickey, 33, who comes to the left with back, back of Kozar and Brennan in motion. Kozar protected well again, looking for the end zone and incomplete. Brian Brennan covered by William Judson, third down. That time, the coverage was there by Judson, about the first time we've seen it tonight. And Miami has been doing this all year long, and that was Don Shuley yelling to the officials, indicating there might have been a pick in that crossing pattern run by the two receivers. There, Brennan coming underneath the wide receiver, Reggie Langhorn out there. And a pass that could have been caught, and he had it right in there, did Kozar. Now Brennan again goes to the right. On third and ten. Reggie Langhorn in the slot. Slaughter outside him. And the pass intended for Slaughter as Kozlowski forced Kozar to get rid of it in a hurry on the blitz. Kozar saw it very quickly. He had to get rid of it. His receiver didn't see it, however. So he dumped it off to avoid the sack. And that'll bring up fourth down. We'll see the field goal unit. That time Miami stiffening somewhat. Perhaps getting a little bit organized, but this has been their problem, their defense, all year long. They've improved over the past three games, but the games that they won were against Buffalo, Indianapolis, and Houston. That's not much. Matt Barr, 32-yard field goal attempt. And the kick is good. So at least they come up with three. We played less than half the first quarter, 7.53 to go in the period. The Browns have already run up over 100 yards in total offense and yet have settled for only three. Three-nothing Cleveland. When Miami has held its opponents this season to 14 or fewer points, they are 4-0. When they've given up 30 or more points, they're 0-5. And that's what we'll have next Monday, and you all know about Joe Montana, the remarkable comeback, the scintillating performance yesterday against St. Louis. He and the 49ers against the Washington Redskins in the nation's capital next Monday at 9 Eastern time. And we're all starting to get very familiar with a young quarterback named Jay Schrader of the Washington Redskins. He has been spectacular over the past few weeks. And we will be there. And for Washington, they're tied for first place with the Giants in the NFC East. 49ers a half game back of the Rams in the NFC West. Back to receive for Miami. Craig Ellis along with Ron Davenport and Matt Barr to kick off for Cleveland. 3 nothing Browns. 7.53 to play in the period. Davenport from the 13 to the 30 and to the 34 yard line. And it's first and 10. Miami at that spot. Davenport, good week last week. Lorenzo Hampton's knee was bothering him. So Davenport saw more action than he has all season and wound up rushing for 74 yards. Don Shula using Lorenzo Hampton much as he has used Tony Nathan over the years. Out of the backfield, Hampton, a good receiver. Miami. 
beaten up on the have nots this season. They four victories against those clubs. First down at the 34. Davenport picks up about four yards. Clay Matthews, the outside backer, and the defensive end, Carl Hairston. Hairston 78 and Matthews 57 make the stop. Where Don Shula feels that they can hit on the pass against the Browns, even with the fine cornerbacks, Miniford, Minifield, and Dixon, is if they can fly Clayton and Duper down into the seam, sort of a slight post pattern, beat the inside coverage that they usually get from the free safety. And that's where he would like to get the big plays from the passing game. Second and five and a double tight end set up, and Marino steps up in the pocket and fires over the middle of the 50 to Dan Johnson. The tight end, and he takes it for a first down, stopped by Chip Banks. Johnson back in the lineup after missing last week's game, and a penalty marker is down. Holding 56 defense, penalty refused, first down. Chip Banks, academic. They take the play, first down, dead on the 50. Marino really zipped that in there. He was under tremendous pressure. The Browns coming with the blitz, and it kind of reminds us of what Don was saying to Al and myself earlier today. He can do things other quarterbacks can't. He has that ball up there, and he just zips it. It has gone so quickly. He reads it so well. He's just a remarkable young quarterback. First and ten is Marino. Retreats. Again, good protection and throws, and it's a seven-yard gain for Ron Davenport to the 43 and again it's Clay Matthews making the stop some people think Marino's not having a terrific season and yet Dan has thrown for 21 touchdowns he's on a pace if he keeps this pace up he'll wind up with 37 touchdown passes and that would be the second most in NFL history second only to himself he broke the old record of 35 back in 84 he's up there with 48 for the season it's amazing Second and three from the 43. Hampton gets one to the 41-yard line. Funny thing about the Dolphins, Frank, they knew it in preseason. They had two areas they were concerned about. The running game, number one. They were hopeful that Hampton would develop, and he's improving. And the other concern was the defense, and that's turned out to be the big concern. So there really have been very few surprises for Miami this year. None whatsoever, and they were not helped, of course, with the multiple injuries that they had. You, losing Hugh Green really hurt them in linebacker. No question about that. But they have had trouble running the ball all year long. They've had incredible trouble stopping the run. And here they are in a third and a little more than a yard situation, and they've had... A lot of trouble with this situation all year long. And the Browns send in Clancy and Pizzuli to stop the run, and they do. Lorenzo Hampton. Stopped for a loss, and it's Dave Pizzuli, 72, who comes in in situations like that. He is a great friend of Marino's and a teammate of Dan at the University of Pittsburgh. Not much friendship involved there as... The short yardage defense of Cleveland just beat the offensive line of the Miami Dolphins completely off the ball. Now McNeil retreats to the 10 and Roby, who got off a 49-yard kick from the end zone. Again, he's second in the league in gross punting, but 12th in net punting. Substantial difference. High kick. And McNeil calls for and makes the fair catch at the 11-yard line. So the Browns are backed up deep in their own territory after a 33-yard Roby effort. 3-0 Cleveland. 4.36 to go in the period. Cleveland Stadium. Al Michaels, Frank Gifford. Dry night. Very cool night. Temperature in the low 30s, but not too breezy. And that makes a big difference in a ballpark by a lake. There was a penalty on the punt before we went away. Illegal motion against Miami and Cleveland refused it. They just want the ball back even though it is at their 11-yard line. The way they've been moving, it barely matters where they take over. Two good drives, but only three points thus far from the 11. Kozar to throw. Newsom! To the 35-yard line. Bud Brown got beaten. First down, Cleveland. 
This is what the Browns have been waiting to happen, and that is Ozzie Newsom to get well. He was injured the first week. He had an ankle injury, then he had a shoulder injury. He comes off the line of scrimmage, and no one does it better, and no one's been doing it better for a lot of years, particularly at the tight end position. Newsom comes down with it. Gets the Browns away from their 10-yard line. First down out to the 36-yard line. Dickey and Mack, the running backs. Brennan in motion from the 36. Dickey looking for room. Slithering to the outside. Turns it into a good gain to the 40, to the 30. And finally run down at the 17-yard line. Good move. The way Dickey, in a way, used to run. He had so many good years, one great year with the Colts. Then all of a sudden, faded, waved, picked up here, picked his spot, and off he went. Hey, if this were a fight, they might stop it. The Browns can do just about whatever they want to do. He looks in, he pecks and looks. He's not a, a slashing-type runner. He takes a good look, and then he still has a lot of speed, and he turns it on down the sidelines, takes it down inside the 25-yard line, and... Dickey, who came on waivers from the Colts a year ago, had a 100-yard game a week ago, so Dickey has really given the Browns running tack quite a shot of the arm, particularly since they have lost Spiner. Longest rushing play of the season for Cleveland. Fake reverse, Kozar throws, and a short gain as Kevin Mack holds on at the 15-yard line. Cleveland just able to do just whatever they want to do, either on the ground or in the air. Those are having a big night. Still, they've only managed three points on the scoreboard, but we could be looking at 17 had not a couple of things happened. A fumble football, a drop pass in the end zone. They have totally dominated. In the playoff game last season, Kozar ended the day with 66 yards passing against Miami. Tonight, he's almost doubled that total already, 131 yards. Totally different offense under Lindy Infante, the new offensive coordinator. Second and seven, Newsom in motion. Kozar protected well again. Throws complete to Dickey, and Dickey is run out of bounds at about the two. And the Browns just moving at will. Three, four plays. They move from the 10 yard line down to inside Miami's five yard line for a first down and goal to go. Moved it on the ground, they moved it in the air. Ran into some paint or some other substance as he was knocked out of bounds. So it's interesting to go back and recall Cleveland came out against a team that was rated 27th against the rush. They came out through the ball six consecutive times. Now they are picking, pecking, and doing just about whatever they want to do. The Browns nearing 200 yards here in the first quarter. First and goal. And Kozar to throw from everywhere. Incomplete. Harry Holt, the tight end, and he was covered on the play by the rookie Ockerdahl. Second down. Holt is the other tight end. Newsom coming back, blocking inside. Kozar getting in a little bit of trouble. Now he's not pretty when he moves around back there. Looks a little bit like a, a big crane, but he is very effective. He can throw the ball off balance a lot more effectively than he looks like he can. That's a pass that could have been caught by Holt, the former Canadian Football League player. Kozar has yet to throw a bad pass. Second and goal. Newsom in motion. And Mack diving, but too early. That was a long dive. Yeah, it's land there. <laughs> it sure was. <laughs> Style points, well, not many. I mean, that, that works from the one. It doesn't work from the two and a half real well. Third and goal. Kevin Mack has really taken up the slack, though, since the loss of Ernest Beiner with a bad ankle. He's lost for the season. Let's take a look at Mack. He tried to take off from the <laughs> five, and there perhaps is only one man that could do that, and I would say Marcus Allen. He would have come close from the five. Kevin Mack, he comes down at the two. Carl Lewis would have a shot, too. Third and goal. Kozar fires incomplete, intended for Newsom, who was there. Bernie rifled it, 
and he had to get rid of it because Bud Brown was blitzing from his safety spot. And again, as we look at Kozar, under a lot of pressure, he holds it to the last possible second and tries to zip it into Newsom. And he knows he's going to get popped right there. Finds Newsom in the back of the end zone, and that's another one that could have been caught. And you're right, Kozar has yet to throw the bad pass, but as much as they move the football, they are now looking at a chip shot to bring it to six to nothing. The only thing you can slightly fault him on on that one is, is he really rifled it. Meanwhile, Barr, a 19-yard field goal attempt is good. And for Miami, somebody has to be fingering some beads because they've given up almost 200 yards, or in other words, an 800-yard pace here tonight, and they're only down 6 nothing. Interesting, too, when you consider the fact that Mark Clayton and Mark Duper are on the offensive unit of the Miami Dolphins. They can get that back and take the lead in a in about seven or eight seconds or wherever they might be from anywhere on the field. And I know that Marty Schottenheimer wishes he had put some more points up on the scoreboard because, again, this offense of the Dolphins can really light up that scoreboard like a pinball machine when Marino gets hot with Duper and Clayton. Don Shula, not only a former Brown, but is from this area, roots here. A reminder coming up, CFA College football. Penn State ranked third, taking on Notre Dame, or seventh-ranked Texas A&M. Very much in the driver's seat in the Southwest Conference, meeting Arkansas in Little Rock Saturday with college football today coverage at 3 Eastern time. It's kind of a homecoming for Don Shula. He played for the Cleveland Browns a couple of years, and then he went on to Baltimore and Washington. But he is an Ohioan at heart. Bars kick in the direction of Ellis, and he lets it go out of bounds, and so they'll tee it up again back at the 30-yard line with a minute and 59 seconds to play in the first quarter. Again for Cleveland tonight, a chance to move on top in the AFC Central. They'd be 7-3. and three. Cincinnati would be 6-4, and four, and you can forget about Pittsburgh and Houston. And for Miami, if they entertain any hopes of making it as a wild card, a win tonight is just about mandatory the way things look and there it is for you graphically Cleveland six and three coming in Bengals upset yesterday Steelers losing to Buffalo and then Houston beating Cincy and in the meantime a lot of the heat taken by Chuck Studley the defensive coordinator of the Miami Dolphins this season replaced a bit of a legend Bill Arnsparker who went over to LSU to become the head coach there and Studley, formerly with the 49ers, then he went down to Houston, and he has taken the heat, but the heat really has been mostly from the injuries, and particularly one, we will hark back to it again, Hugh Green, who Don Shula gave first and a second-round draft pick a year ago to Tampa Bay to get. He is gone for the year, and hopefully there will be something left to his career, very severely injured knee. Bar is kicked. Ellis, who recently was in the Canadian Football League to the 30 and out to the 42-yard line. So a nice run back by Craig Ellis, and Miami has it near midfield as they start this drive with a minute and 48 seconds to play in the first quarter, and Cleveland on top six to nothing. Ellis is from the CFL, is up there five years and played with five different teams, and just a few weeks ago was released by... Toronto, good return man, and he's taking the pressure off a rookie, James Pruitt, a rookie wide receiver, who now is playing that much better as a wide receiver because he is off those special return teams. Short count on first and ten, and the pass to Hampton, who juggles the ball, and incomplete is the ruling. No fumble, incomplete. He never had control, in the opinion of the line judge. And the line judge tonight is Jack Johnson. Hampton again out of the backfield, reverse angle, and you'll see it a little better. He never did control the football. There he is, moving out and through the flat. Frank Meniford. Menifield was up there quickly to put on the hit, but never had control of it. Second and ten, Miami from the 43-yard line. Davenport. And Hampton are the running backs. 
And they both go into the pattern, and Marino fires complete at the 37-yard line to Mark Duper for a first down. Chris Rockins had him pretty well covered, but the pass thrown right on the money and a first down. Hard to do in single coverage, and you see Menefield passing him on, and now he'll be picked up by Rockins. Rockins tries to close the gap, but Marino puts the zip on it, and Duper comes down with the first down at the 37-yard line, and word from the sidelines is that the nose tackle, Bob Baumauer, has left the game, a pulled groin muscle. We don't know whether he'll be back or not. And they just keep adding up for the Dolphins. Mm -hmm, don't they? First down with Clayton in motion, and Hampton gives it to Clayton on a reverse. 30, inside the 20, out of bounds at the 14-yard line. Mark Clayton. You can see it all the way from here. It's a very fired-up defensive unit for the Cleveland Browns, and what you do when you get somebody is that pursues like the Browns, you run the reverse play against them. You see all the white moving to the left. Now here comes Clayton back against the grain, takes the handoff. Maybe if he had broken that inside, he could have taken to the end zone, but he gets the first down at the 15. First time they've run that play this season. That's Clayton's first rush of the year. Good against the Browns because they are hard pursuing defense. They chase everything. First down from the 15. Or is there something if they can get it in? Sure. And Marino throws too high, intended for Bruce Hardy, and he was covered by Ray Ellis, the safety. Second down. Cleveland up and down the field throughout the entire first quarter, and now all of a sudden Miami with still a great offensive team with Marino and Duper and Clayton. They're down there threatening. Second and ten, Miami at the 15-yard line. The Browns dominating, statistically anyway, the first quarter. Leading 6-0, but it's a very tenuous lead at the moment. 43 seconds to play in the period. Second and ten. Davenport. He gets to the nine-yard line. And it will be third down, four. You have to call it every now and then, and Don Shula changed it off instead of going with the pass. Comes with the draw. That keeps the defense at least partially honest against Miami. But they know Miami features the run, the pass, not the run. But every now and then you come with the draw. Such a big play in their offense just to keep the defense honest. You'll see pass now. Cooper left, Clayton right. As they bring in the four wide receivers. That means also in there is Pruitt and the veteran Matt Moore. Third and four, just before the gun. Lost it to the end zone, incomplete. Flag is down. Duper, the intended receiver, and a marker thrown in the end zone on what will be the final play of the period. With well, Dixon and Duper. Contact, number 29 defense. Five against Duper. Automatic first down. That's Dixon. That's an automatic first down, and that will mean when the second period commences, it will be first and goal for Miami from about the four. What do you do down there with my Marino throwing it, even though Dixon was able to get the hand on there, slow him up a little bit. Had he not, have chosen to do so. had he not, Duper would have come down with it. Time runs out of the quarter, but here it is again, and Dixon, when you're down in there in your own territory, 5, 10, 12 yard line, you've got to play up so tight, you can't can hardly not make that illegal contact if you're playing against somebody like a Duper or Clayton. Time has run out here in the first quarter. At least the clock on the scoreboard says it's run out. The Dolphins and some of the Browns started to go back the other way. A half can't end on a defensive penalty. Or a game. Or a game. But a quarter... It, it can't end either, and it has to do with the wind and field conditions. Miami has the option of extending the quarter if they wish, and they do wish it under these circumstances. And first and goal from the five-yard line. And that's Hampton, and now maybe they shouldn't have wished it. They'll bring it back the other way. They figured with the momentum and everything, instead of taking all of the time and bringing it back down the other end, they'd see if they can cash in, but they'll try it 
going from east to west instead when we come back to start the second quarter. A lot of yardage, but still only two field goals. Six nothing Browns. There's Pat Modell, Art Modell, the owner of the Cleveland Browns' wife, and next to Pat is Mr. Television, Milton Burl and his wife, Ruth. I asked him if he had a commercial. He said, yes, January 27th, Friars Club, Liza Bonelli. Achievement Award. Good friend of Art's, and he's here frequently for their home games. There he is, the owner of the Browns since 1962, and very active league policy. Very actively involved in television negotiations that are coming up. And a great gentleman, I might add, also. Second and goal, Miami, as we start the second quarter from the Cleveland five-yard line. And it's Davenport who gets to the three. Davenport this season has had a tough time scoring from inside the five. He is 0 for 4 in attempts from inside the five-yard line. Lorenzo Hampton in recent weeks has been the man they've gone to when they've been down close. They run the ball twice down here when everyone knows their gun is the pass with Marino and Clayton and Duper. Now they got themselves in a must-pass situation. They bring in the four wide receivers. That will bring in James Pruitt. Clayton will be out there. Duper will be out there. And the veteran Nat Moore. And they deploy on opposite sides of the field, trying to spread that defense, get single coverage. Marino will try and read it, find the man that will be alone in single coverage. He keeps Nathan in and sends him into the pass pattern, and it's incomplete, intended for Mark Cooper. The coverage by hand for Dixon, and so Miami's drive has been aborted, and they hope to settle for three. Duper against Dixon once again. Marino knew that's what it was going to be, knew it was going to be single. Dixon just did a fine job on Duper. When you're down in there that close, you're playing man for man. You can play him so much more tightly than you can when you're out of the middle of the field. And Dixon and Minifield are two of the best in the game. Kawad Reves, and Miami is the only team that has missed more field goal attempts than Nathan, but he can hardly miss from here. And this one goes through. 20-yard field goal by Fouad Reves. And it's Cleveland 6, Miami 3, early in the second quarter. Our ABC Sports exclusive is being brought to you by Mercedes-Benz, engineered like no other car in the world. We've had a lot of footballs moving up and down the field, a lot of yardage and very few points, Al. It's amazing as you look at the numbers there, and you can add three more yards in total yardage to Miami's numbers. And... How many times can you say you've seen a game where 15 minutes and 48 seconds have been played? You have 291 yards in total offense. 291 and no touchdowns. 6-3 Cleveland. As the kickoff comes down and after some confusion, it's taken at the 13-yard line. And Fontenot brings it back out to the 23. Talked about the few points we have an injury. flag. Cleveland Brown, a flag is down, but how about those two games yesterday? Denver getting knocked off by San Diego. Rams getting knocked off by New Orleans. No touchdowns. Illegal block in the back. Number 81 on the run back. 10 yard penalty and a first down. Harry Holt. Meanwhile, a couple of the Browns drops that have cost them dearly thus far. Slaughter who was shaken up, too. And that would have been a touchdown. Here's one you wouldn't count on. Ozzie Newsom, back of the end zone. Sure-handed Ozzie. Now Cleveland from its own 13, and they've been moving through the Miami defense like it was a sieve. Clarence Weathers is in the game, and that's he who takes the pass at the 17, and he's run out of bounds outside the 20. Second catch of the season for the sparingly used Weathers, who was a big play man last year. You know, Al, if we watch Bernie Kosar, you can almost watch the development. We covered their game back in August against Miami. We were here for the first week of the season against Cincinnati. And you watch him tonight, he just seems to ooze more confidence. And you know that if he stays healthy, he's a bright young man with a great arm. He's going to become a great one. 
second and one. Kevin Mack, who gained over a thousand yards last season, has a first down. He takes it to the 25. Meanwhile, Webster Slaughter was shaken up a bit, and that's the reason Weathers is in there. But Slaughter is up and Adam and appears to be ready to come back in the game when needed. Kevin Mack, he and Ernest Biner, you'll recall, each gained over a thousand yards last year. But Mack's been bothered with a shoulder this year, has missed a lot of action. Biner is now on injured reserve, and they've been using more and more of Dickey. First and ten from the 25. Cleveland ahead, 6-3. Looking for Newsom. Batted away. Nice play by Brudzinski, who got back there. Bad ankle and all to bat it away. That really is not what Brudzinski does the best. He was back there helping Bud Brown, but he got in there beautifully. Good pass protection once again for Kozar. No pass rush, and that's been the problem, one of the many problems for the defensive unit of the Dolphins. No pressure on the passer, but Brzezinski got back from the linebacking spot, helped out Bud Brown, got the deflection. His ankle has been bothering him. Also, a hamstring cost Brzezinski a lot of time in practice this week, but he gets back there that time, and it's second and ten from the 25. Fake to Mack, throw to Dickey, and he's run out of bounds at the 32-yard line by Glenn Blackwood, whose brother Lyle is hurt. Lyle's career may be over, but Glenn is still going strong. Glenn, of course, was hurt earlier in the year, and Don Chula is so happy to have him back in there. He has credited a lot of the improvement over the past few weeks on the part of the defense to Glenn Blackwood being back in, back in action. He calls the defense as he changes off back there. Very bright, very heady. And he, when he's out of there, they hurt. Third down and a short three from the 32. Kozar, three-man rush, applies no pressure. And Fontenot makes the catch at the 35 of the Dolphins. So the Dolphins drop the rush three. Kozar had all the time in the world, and Offerdahl makes the stop after a 33-yard game. Yeah, the game of the offensive line. What a masterful job they did for Kozar. He just stood back there, picked one out. Fadano, who came with a big catch a week ago against Indianapolis, gets another one. He is a former wide receiver at LSU, who is now a running back with the Browns, but they are able to move him out there, and it really confuses the defense. And Cleveland has used this play for the past few weeks, and it's effective once again. Kozar already 195 yards. Langhorn in motion. Counter goes to Dickey. And that's one of the few plays Miami has been able to stop tonight. Rudzinski making the stop on the very slow developing play. That's what Brzezinski is really good at. That is the run defense. Came from the Rams a few years ago when they had trouble signing him. Took over that left linebacker position. They took an all-pro linebacker, the Dolphins did. Moved him to defensive end, Kim Bocamper. He was released this year. Brzezinski still stays on. And while he's not playing up to Brzezinski's caliber, that's mostly because he has been injured much of the season. Tough against the run. Second and 12 from the 38. Kozar gets pressure this time and has to throw it away through low intended for Mack and T.J. Turner put the pressure on and forced Bernie to get rid of it hastily. Mike Charles was also in there. But again, that's the closest thing the Dolphins have come to any kind of a sack tonight. They only have 21 thus far this season. Consequently, they only have eight interceptions as Slaughter now is continuing to limp on the sidelines, trying to loosen it up on his own. Third and 12, Langhorn and Weathers go wide to the left, and Brennan comes wide to the right with Fontenot in the backfield. Fontenot stays in the block, and Kozar sets up and looks over the middle to the 25 to Newsom. And Ozzie holds on and has the first down. 
And that's why he's all pro, and that's why he is what he is. Ozzie Newsom not only makes the catch, knew exactly where he had to be for the first. Exactly. Great shot. Great camera shot. Blackwood trying to get back into it, but timed out beautifully, and again, perfect protection for Bernie Kozar. No pressure. Newsom took it down about 13. He needed about two yards less than that. Was able to come back to Kozar and gets the first down. Browns at the Dolphin 25. Mack the fullback. Dickey the tailback. They've been here before and they've been unable to get it in. Dickey. A couple. Mark Brown met him along with Jackie Ship, the two linebackers. 10 15 to go in the half. Browns on top 6 to 3. That's the old adage. We'll stretch, but we'll never break. Well, the Dolphins, that's a little ridiculous. They have really stretched tonight. <laughs> And they're continuing to stretch once again, but nevertheless, they trail by three. And there's been no indication at all that Miami's going to be able to stop Cleveland all night. Second and eight from the 23-yard line. Kozar to Dickey, fighting for the 16, short of the first down by a yard or so. Stopped by Blackwood. Third and one or two coming up. That's what the Browns can do with not only Dickey, but Fontenot. They can take the running back, put him out as a wide receiver, and they have been very effective with it. Big test for the Dolphin defense now. Third and a little more than a yard to go. Would not be at all surprised. With the confidence they have in their offense, they might even go with some kind of play fake action and try to get it into the end zone. But they are letting thus far Miami stay in this game. And Pizzuli, Pizzuli is the fullback. The mini refrigerator, Pizzuli, and on an end around, it's Holt. First down, and Holt is in for the touchdown. Fine call. They stayed in that huddle a long time, talking something over. And they made the play action right up into the middle, as you would anticipate, on third and short. Dolphins bought it all the way. Holt coming around on the reverse. We'll look at it from the reverse angle. You see it beautifully. Everyone went for the dive back. Kevin Mack, and here comes Holt. Takes it into the end zone, just catching the corner. And the Browns do it on third and short, what they've been unable to do thus far. And the Browns castigated by a local columnist today for a very dull <laughs> offense. Put the nose tackle in as a fullback and run an end around, a tight end around on third and one for the touchdown. Barr's extra point is not a thing of beauty, but it's functional. You can do that kind of a play, particularly when you have confidence that so you can move the football just about at will. It's one of the advantages of being able to dominate offensively, even though you did not get the points on the scoreboard. You can do something like this because you can come back with a fourth and short and go for the first down. Here's Harry Holt once again. The Dolphins bought it all the way. An uh, excellent call. Cleveland extending their lead. Harry Holt, and we call him the other tight end, and you have to refer to any other tight end beside Newsom as the other tight end. He has not caught a pass this season. That's the first time he's carried the ball this year. And he goes for the touchdown. Kick goes to the five-yard line, taken there by Davenport. And he fumbles the ball at the 15-yard line and a big scramble. And Miami has it. That could have opened the gates. But Miami gets it back. And if you're thinking about moving away, we'll remind you it was 21-3 to late in the third quarter in the playoff game as we look at it from the reverse angle. And the Dolphins came back, of course, to win that one. Travis, Stepped out of there. Travis Tucker was the man who forced the fumble. And then the day is saved by number 51, and that's Mark Brown, the linebacker. So here comes Marino and company, 18-yard line. Cleveland ahead 13-3 to the air. Down the sideline, Clayton incomplete. Clayton in minifield, second down. Former Louisville teammates, and how many times have you seen Clayton come down 
with that kind of a ball. He's a scrambler, he's a fighter, but he's running up against another one tonight in Minifield, who they love man-for-man -man coverage. Minifield, his counterpart on the other side, Dixon, they just love it. There they go, and Minifield with a hand in the air, very strong, rips it out. And Clayton more than likely and usually would come down with that football. He's done it so frequently in his four years. Second and ten, Miami from the 18-yard line. Hampton stopped immediately, and that's Pizzuli, who's been playing very well in recent weeks. He's really done a job in the middle for Cleveland. And he's done it in particular with his pass rush. He has six sacks in the last four weeks, and here he stops the run. He stuffs Hampton. Dolphins trying to run the football. They are 26th coming into tonight, running the football out of 28 teams in the NFL. And they have tried to do it and on some particularly unusual situations as the Browns, once again, use that four-down line. That employs Pizzuli as a defensive tackle, where he has been outstanding. And with four wideouts going into the pattern on third and 11, it's caught by Clayton. A nice catch, and he picks up the first down out of bounds at the 32-yard line. Mark Clayton, he and Duper running neck and neck for the team receiving lead. Mark with 35 coming in, and that's number 36 on the season now for him. Every time you think you have the Dolphins hurt, you stop them a couple of times, and then the gun goes back there. Marino fires one that Clayton or Duper takes away from a defender. They get the first down. I don't know how many of you watched the Jets and the Dolphin game earlier in the year in which the Jets finally prevailed 51 to 45, but this team will just keep coming back at you. They don't have the defense to hold the score down, but they will run up the points. Marino changing the play at the line of scrimmage. First and 10 from the 31, under pressure. Scrambling and sliding, and stays in bounds as he goes down near the 37-yard line. Marino, and that gives him a, a moment to spend without using a timeout for another word on the bench. Marino, that's the first time all season that Marino has run for a game. First time all year. I said at the outset, we won't see a lot of running from Marino and Cozart tonight. Don Schiller gives him a lot of leeway. He can change the play anytime he wants to. Overrule anything that they call, as a matter of fact. He doesn't do it often, and it better be right when he does. Second and five from the 36-yard line. The inside handoff, Davenport. And he's out to the 42, and that's a first down. Anthony Griggs makes the tackle. And again, the Dolphins just running to keep some honesty in the attack. But it's been a long time since Miami has had a 100-yard rushing game. You'd have to go back a couple of years. First and ten from the 43. Cleveland saying once again with their four down line. And they've been using this now for several weeks. And very effectively. Marino rolling a la against the Bears last year. And throws complete to the 50-yard line to Clayton. Who runs east-west and then north-south to the 40. And out of bounds at the 35-yard line. Mark Clayton. He's covered about 125 yards on that particular play. Let's go back and look at it again. Marino with a little rollout, a little pocket moving with him, giving protection. There's Larry Lee, 66, right out in front of him, along with Stevenson. Comes to Clayton. Now he sprints back across the field. He has great acceleration. Gets away from a diving attempt there by Hanford Dixon. Finally runs out of gas, but gets the first down near the 35-yard line. Five fifty-four to play in the half. Cleveland on top, 13-3. Marino and complete at the 25-yard line and a nice catch by Hardy, the tight end. So Hardy comes to the sideline and Bruce, the ninth-year man out of Arizona State, makes his 24th catch of the year. 
You see it again. Again, Marino reading it properly. Hardy makes it look like he's going to take it up. He has individual coverage from Ray Ellis. Slides to the outside and gets another first down. And this is what you always dread about the Dolphins. No matter what you do to them, no matter how you hammer them defensively against their defense, they're going to come back at you because they still have the offense. Hampton. Ooh. Coming up was Minifield. Minifield all over the joint. Great man-to-man, great pass coverage, and he can do the job here, too. He's 5'9", 180 pounds, and plays about 6'3". Terrific tackle here against Hampton. Nails him behind the line of scrimmage. He is up to make the stop for about a three-yard loss. Covering wide receivers, man for man, deep downfield. Does it all over the corner. Second down, 14. Miami at the Cleveland, 28. Four and a half minutes to go in the half. Caught at the 25-yard line by Hampton, short game, covered on the play by Banks. Marino is looking deep, had to settle for Hampton again because of the fine coverage by Minifield. He had picked up Clayton. He was glued all over him. And meanwhile, on the other side of the field, Dixon and Duper are getting it on in almost every play. Meanwhile, Wright and Harper come in as the extra defensive backs for Cleveland. So they have six defensive backs in on third down and ten from the 25. Marino going deep. Huh. Touchdown to Duper. So Cleveland goes to the dime defense and it isn't worth 10 cents. Touchdown Miami. Duper just blew right by Minifield. Minifield trying to play him close. He had about a three-step lead on him. When you do that, Marino will put it in there on a rope. There he is. Just runs right by him. He has that great acceleration, just like Clayton on the other side. And Marino was right there. What an arm. He had smoke on that one. No way the Minifield could recover after being beaten by a couple of yards. Juan Reves picks it through and with 331 to go in the half it is Duper, a man who was shut out last year in the playoff game between these two teams when they held Clayton and Duper to one catch that by his opposite number again good blocking for Marino and Duper with his sixth touchdown catch to get Miami very close At Cleveland, Al Michaels and Frank Gifford, and this has the makings of a very wild one. Cleveland on top by a score of 13 to 10. Neither team showing much in terms of stopping the other. And the only amazing aspect is that we've only had 23 points thus far. From Reno, 19 consecutive games now, touchdown pass. Kind of puts into perspective the achievement of one John Unitas, who holds the record at 47. So Danny's not even halfway there. Reves kicks off, and it's a short kick, and it's taken up at the 12-yard line by McNeil. Or, and he brings it back to the 27. Now is when Don Chula, I'm sure, is hoping he can get a performance from the defense. He had his defense pushed around throughout the entire first quarter. Cleveland moving the ball on the ground, moving into the air anywhere they want to do. Nevertheless, they couldn't get the points except for a drop pass and actually what two drop passes and a fumble. This game could have been blown away in the first quarter. That is not the case. Miami is within three, but now they need a showing by the defense. First and ten, Cleveland from the 27-yard line. Gozard completing passes nearly at will. Newsom was well covered, but he drills it in there. And it will be second down eight. Think about Kozar. You know the story. Bernie would have been a senior at Miami this year, and he would have been there with Testaverde. Kozar is actually a couple of weeks younger 
than Testa Verde. That is amazing. He won't be, what, 23 until November the 25th. Mm -hmm. Not only the youngest quarterback in the league, but the, not only the youngest starter, but the youngest quarterback in the league. Brennan in motion on second and two. Mack, nice move. Read it right, exploited the hole, and turns it into a nice little gain after the 42 in the first down. Mark Brown makes the tackle. Go back to September of 84. Remember that cover in SI's College and Pro Spectacular? The two guys in Miami, and I think John Underwood said something about uh, half kiddingly, who's the best quarterback in the city of Miami? And there they were. I wonder who would be the backup in Miami today had he not chosen to turn professional. From the 42, Cozart, uh, Newsom, first down. Gets to the 45 of the Dolphins. And this is what the Browns have sorely missed. Ozzie Newsom, a healthy Ozzie Newsom, because he is an offense unto himself when he is healthy. The big tight end who came into the night with over 500 career receptions as we get the two-minute warning. But Ozzie is healthy once again. The shoulder is much better. He moves on the ankle. Newsom is now five receptions for 69 yards already. Best in the NFL, 293 yards in a losing effort earlier this year against Cincinnati. Here, first down, Cleveland from the 45. Bozar has to step up and drop it off and hits Mack. And Mack has a first down if they give him progress inside the 35, which they do. And Cleveland, remember, had to use a timeout in the first quarter. Kozar brought him up to the 15-yard line and called timeout, so they had two remaining. What a good move by Mack to get that first down. Now the little man is in there. Clarence Weathers, only 5'9", split up to the top of your screen. We're seeing a lot of him now with Slaughter still limping on the sidelines. Brennan in motion on first and 10 from the 35-yard line. Kozar gets outside pressure and then throws for Newsom too far. Pressure that time from Brudzinski and Jackie Sheff provided the coverage on the receiving end. Second and ten. What a difference it is, though, when you can pressure the quarterback. That time, Kozar just couldn't sit back there and consequently overthrew the ball. But Brown with pretty good coverage, but he was behind, and we're looking forward to that one, the nation's capital. Montana back. We're going to show you some of the action from yesterday when he made a return after undergoing back surgery <laughs> less than two months ago just remarkable i talked to him a week ago last wednesday he said well i don't know when i'm coming back he's going to make uh, back surgery fashionable second down and 10 from the 35 yard line kozar right over the middle and that's complete and inside the 25 yard line is newsom his sixth catch of the night and a first down and the clock keeps moving, and again, they have a pair of timeouts left. And they don't want to spend one here. This is the maturity. Kozar, very cool. He's not hustling anything. Very calm. Second sticking away, but he's very cool back there. Fontenot makes the catch, tries to get out of bounds, but can't. He is stopped inbounds at the 19-yard line. And now Cleveland spends... It's second timeout. So one remaining, and they will have a second down and five at the 19-yard line. Not a good move by Fontenot. He could have taken that out of bounds. He took the risk for a couple of yards to the inside, and Cleveland has to use one of the timeouts to get them down to one timeout. Let's go back to yesterday's game, the Raiders and the Cowboys. In the second quarter, the score was tied 3-3. And it was Tony Dorsett who gained over 100 yards, but one of those rare occasions when he gets over 100 and Dallas loses, that put him on top 10 to 3. But in the third quarter, with Mark Wilson having to come out, a poor performance in the first half, it was Jim Plunkett, and the venerable one came in. Links here with Doki Williams. That touchdown tied it at 10. Dallas went ahead on a field goal to make it 13-10, but then on second and 15 in the fourth quarter at the Dallas 40, it was Plunkett again, linking up with Doki Williams again. And despite triple coverage in the end zone, Doki Williams comes down with the ball, a great catch, and the Raiders, in a critical game, win it by a score of 17-13. to The Raiders have now won six out of their last seven, very much in the hunt for a wild card. 
and maybe even more. Who knows? Second and five from the 19-yard line. Kozar, off-balance throw, and that's one of his few poor passes of the night. Again, he experienced a little bit of pressure, and that time he had to step out of it and deliver the ball as Miami seems to get it sparingly, but they were able to put it on here. And it was Betters, who was one of their better pass rushers a couple of years ago and last year, held out throughout the entire training camp this year and has been playing behind T.J. Turner. But he was the man in there on Kozar, forced him to hurry that pass. One timeout left for Cleveland, third and five from the 19. Kozar, juggle, and Langhorn makes the catch somehow, some way. Lankford and Rose were the guys covering on it, and the clock is now stopped by Cleveland with 24 seconds. Let's take a look at it again. That was just an incredible piece of concentration on the part of Langhorn. We'll look at it with the reverse angle. You'll see it better. There's the deflection. It was Langford getting a hand in there. The ball goes up, batted away once again. Langhorn finally comes down with the ball, and the Dolphins were able to keep him inbound. It was Donovan Rose and Langford once again making sure the Langhorn stayed inbounds, and Cleveland has to use their final timeout. Cleveland on top, 13 10, 24 seconds. As Kozar comes to the bench, it'll be first down goal at the six yard line. Time, of course, to get a playoff and then also get your field goal unit back out onto the field, even without timeouts. And I'm sure they're thinking pass. They're thinking into the end zone pass in all probability, and they are certainly. Deeply considering Ozzie Newsom. He is superb down here. He's strong, the big tight end coming off the line of scrimmage. He'll battle back for the football. And they like to use him, and particularly now that he's helping. First and goal from the six. Pontino and Brennan going in the slot with Brennan in motion now. And Kozar has a tip incomplete. Throwing out in the flat for Pontino. And the Dolphins able to get a hand on it and make it second down. Could have got themselves in a bit of a hurry situation there had they been able to complete the pass. Montano maybe get to the line of scrimmage. Dolphins, of course, slow getting off. They would have plenty of time to get the field goal unit out there, but it would have been they would have been hurrying to get there. You don't want that. You want to make sure you get something out of this drive. This game is close, and the Dolphins. As the Browns well know that they can score at any time. On second and goal, Kozar, who had pointed, oh, yeah. flag goes down, and Langhorn and Judson got tangled up. And the Dolphins feel it should very much be against the Browns for pushing off. There's Judson. Defensive interference number 49 on the one foot line. First and goal. On the one foot line. And 16 seconds, no timeouts. Judson against Langhorn. You'll see it good, too. There's no question about it. Top of your screen, number 49 is Judson. Gets his hands in there. Not giving Langhorn an opportunity to go for the ball. Langhorn immediately looking for a flag. He already had one. All right, so you want to be a coach now. You're Schottenheimer. If you run a running play and it fails, you're not going to have time to get the field goal unit in and have a, a most opportunistic chance for Barr. So do you pass it? What do you do here? You throw it. I think you do, too. Langhorn in motion. Those are to throw it. And that's incomplete. But it stops the clock with 12 seconds. Brennan covered by Blackwood. Another thing it does also, it shows you the faith that Marty Schottenheimer has in young Bernie Kozar. He's 22 years old, giving him a lot of leeway. He's trusting him not to throw the ball to the wrong receiver, not to get an interceptor down here. And Kozar obviously being very careful with it as he tries to squeeze it into a 
sure-handed Brian Brennan for the last couple of years has been the leading outside receiver for these Browns. It was one he ordinarily should have caught. And we'll probably see something very similar to that again. Second and goal. Langhorn in motion again. Bozar lofting it incomplete. Intended for Langhorn. Third down. Nine seconds now. Crazy little situation here because you can't afford to run it even though you're at the one foot line you can't afford to run it because if he doesn't get in then you miss the opportunity to get even three they couldn't afford to run it two plays ago with 16 seconds they know that and they'll just keep it in the air keep it into the end zone they'll try it one more time and again a lot of faith in Marty Schottenheimer and his young quarterback Bernie Kozar not to foul this up because they want to go in with some more points Brennan in motion. And on third and goal, Kozar going incomplete. Intended for Fontenot in three seconds, and now Barr has to come in. He so had three he, shots at it, though, and he didn't mess it up. They'll get their three points, or they certainly should. And Schottenheimer letting the youngster go, letting him grow. But more than that, they're playing the Miami Dolphins, and they know they need all the points they can get because... The Dolphins are for sure going to put some more points on the board. So Cleveland just marching up and down the field and running up a massive total in terms of yardage, but held to just one touchdown. It's going to look like the national debt when they get through with it. But the points won't. Far 18-yard field goal good. And Cleveland at the half as time has run out leads Miami by a score of 16 to 10 and we'll return to Cleveland after this word and a message from your local station. Dolphin 16 to 10 a very unusual first half in the Cleveland was able to move the football just about any time they wanted to do however they are only six points ahead. As a matter of fact it's been a very unusual weekend throughout the National Football League. How about the way Denver lost? How about the way the Rams lost? Two division leaders going down no touchdown scored in those games. It was that kind of weekend. It was unusual all the way around. The High Flying Jets invaded Fulton County Stadium yesterday and they put on a dazzling second quarter offensive display behind quarterback Ken O'Brien. O'Brien was a top rated quarterback in the NFL a year ago and if anything he has improved considerably over that. Here he is in the second quarter looking for number 88 Altoon and the speedster blows by number 28 Brett Clark for a 59 yard touchdown. The Jets on top 7 to nothing. O'Brien, 26 of 33 for the day, 322 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions, almost the perfect day. This time, he looks for Wesley Walker, and it's a 46-yard touchdown to put the Jets on top, 14 to nothing. At one point, O'Brien set a club record of 17 consecutive completions, breaking Joe Namath's record of 15. Once again, Wesley Walker gives him a target at the back of the end zone. The Jets on top, 21 to nothing. They beat the Falcons 28 to 14. Joe Walton's Jets are 9 and 1. That's the best record in all of football, and they've won eight straight games. That's the club record. Candlestick Park in San Francisco. Remember, less than two months ago, Joe Montana underwent back surgery. Many were saying it was the end of a career. But Joe Montana came back yesterday and in a big way. First quarter action, San Francisco leading 3 to nothing. Montana is back. He lets fly to number 80, Jerry Rice. 45 yards and a touchdown, and San Francisco is off running 10 to nothing. In the second quarter, San Francisco leading 13 to 3. They batted a field goal. Play action. Once again, Montana back and fires to Jerry Rice. This time a post pattern. Rice, a diving catch over Carl Carter for a 40 yard touchdown to make it 20 to 3, San Francisco. Now in the third quarter, still Montana. And still is Jerry Rice. Their third touchdown of the day. But what a return for Joe Montana as San Francisco defeats St. Louis 43 to 17. And we'll see if Montana and the 49ers are back to Super Bowl form next week on ABC's Monday Night Football as they take on the Redskins live from RFK Stadium in Washington, D.C. at 9 Eastern time. You'll see it right here on ABC. The Redskins with a rising young quarterback star of their own and Jay Schrader. Al, I guess you could call him a medical marvel. A week ago last Wednesday, I was out for Dell Williams Pros for Kids and I drug dinner and I talked to Joe and his wife, Jennifer, who's about to present him with a little uh, Montana. And he said that he might be back by the Washington game. And all of a sudden, here he is playing like he has in that all-pro caliber. Well, the surgeon who performed the surgery a couple of months ago was quoted last week as saying he thought Montana was crazy to go back and do what he was doing. 
and a the lot of people ready could go back. Exactly, had to had to medically clear him. I think a lot of people are wondering why didn't Montana wait? And it was pointed out that he was as good now as he's going to be in a year. So if he could play, he could play now as well as he could next year. He is back. You wonder what Jeff Kemp thinks. Here was Kemp uh, thinking earlier this season he finally got his shot. And then Montana looked like he was definitely done for the year. And then Kemp got hurt, and they had to go with Morosky. And now they're very much back in the in the picture. I'm looking ahead on the schedule, too, when the year ends, the final week of the season, and we'll have a special Friday night game on the mm -hmm. 19th of December. And that could determine it all on the NFC West as the Rams take on the 49ers. But we'll see Montana next week, and we'll also see Jerry Rice, two, three great receivers next week, Rice, Clark, and Monk. And how about uh, that young quarterback the Redskins have? Uh, Jay Schrader came in a year ago with thighs been hurt. All of a sudden, he's turned into a bit of a phenom down there. But again, for Joe Montana, we are so happy he is back in action. We understand his wife, is, Jennifer, is not feeling too well this evening. We wish her the very best. As I mentioned earlier, she is about to present uh, Joe with a little Montana. We'll be back with our second half coverage of the Miami Dolphins and the Cleveland Browns in just a moment. Bernie Kozar, a great first half as he nears a new personal mark, and he's just 19 yards shy of that. Neither quarterback was intercepted in the first half. Neither quarterback was second in the first half. Dan Marino smiling, but his team is down by 10 at 16-10 as we get set to start the third period. 351 total yards of offense for Cleveland, and that's only represented on the scoreboard with 16 points. Reveys to kick off. Fielded at the three by McNeil. 20. Oh. Upended at the 30 yard line. And every time you watch McNeil return a kick, you have to remember he's 5'7 and 143 pounds. Let's take a look at it again. He just does a one way, and that is full blown, all out, 100%. And that's probably why he's one of the best in the league at doing so, as he was with. Houston in the USFL earlier this year. He went 100 yards against Detroit. He's also taken a punt back. He has really put some spice into the Browns' return team. First and 10, Cleveland. Start the second half from the 30-yard line. Pass to Dickey, who is the man in motion, and Dickey gets to the 37-yard line. So Kozar Kars picking up. Just where he leaves off, going to the air. And a look here at the total yardage. Cleveland at 351 and Miami 176 in the first half. Those are now 21 of 34, and it's just been like shooting ducks because he's had a lot of those incompletions that have been dropped. And a couple of drops that could have maybe blown this game out early on, and maybe the Browns might look back a little later on and say, certainly wish they had. Second and three. Big draw. Kozar throws. First down. And oh. out of bounds. And he nearly escaped, but he was out of bounds at the 47. Clarence Weathers. And we talked about the arm of Marino. Look at the zip on this. Kozar just reared back and let it fly. That ball, low trajectory. He had to fire it in there. Had to have that on it. Or Judson would have been up there with the coverage. That's the most difficult pass there is to throw in this game. And that is a deep out pass and Kozar was right there with him. Cleveland has already eclipsed its mark for most yardage in a game this season and they do it in the first minute of the third quarter. First and ten at the 47 yard line with Newsom setting up on the right side. And Kozar going for Langhorn. Has him oh. but he can't hold on. Didn't have possession. Lankford was back there, but he had him beat. I don't know whether Lankford was able to get a hand on an arm or something, but Langhorn started juggling the football. And now he just lost it. Took his eyes off it a little bit. Bobbled the football, and that could have been a quick six. A couple now for Langhorn. Early in the first quarter, he had one that he could have taken in. Second and ten at the 47-yard line. Oh. 
Gozar over the middle, complete to the 33-yard line to Newsom again. He's like a surgeon. Almost any time you see a Brown catch a ball over the middle, it's that man. It is this one, two, three, try to get the big one outside to Langhorn or to Slaughter. Then when you get into a third down must situation, you come back to Ozzie Newsom, and he has been there all night long. Seven catches for Newsom, who's been besieged by injuries this season. Thus, he's been limited to 20 catches in nine games. Seven tonight. Four or five of those for first downs. First and ten at the 34. Kozar not even worried about keeping him honest with a running game and going deep and incomplete at the goal line. Clarence Weathers was there with William Judson. Second down. Judson with a good play because that's the kind of play the receiver can come back and take away from the defender. But again, look at that protection. Mike Babb in the middle of center doing an excellent job. Barron over the left tackle giving a lot of time to Kozar who's just shooting ducks out there if you will. Now, if he follows his pattern he'll go up one more time and before he comes back to Ozzie Newsom for the first down. He starts this half the way he did the first, not even remotely concerned with anything resembling a running game. All throwing, second and ten. Mack breaks a couple of tackles and turns a three or four yard gain into something a little bit more as he gets it down to the 29 yard line. George Little makes the tackle. And it's a five yard pickup, third down and five. I was thinking, Frank, I mentioned the great receivers we'll see next week, and I said we'll see three of them, Rice, Clark, and Monk. Four of them, actually. Rice, Clark, Clark, and Monk. I you was thinking it. about Gary forgetting about Dwight in Gary, the San Francisco-Washington game. <laughs> Gary Clark has been all-world for the past couple of weeks. Will it be Ozzy again? On third and five. And incomplete. So good coverage that time. As Brennan was the intended receiver. And Renee Thompson, a rookie out of Baylor, was right there with him. And thus Barr comes in to attempt a field goal from the 36. So a 46-yarder. Well, with his, his range, he's 15 of 18 on the year. He's hit for 52 yards out. 46-yard attempt and a little shovel, and that doesn't work. As Gossett was the holder, and he tried to shovel the ball, and Mike Charles broke the play up. So a little trickery and deceit gets Cleveland nowhere, and Miami takes over with 12-16 to go in the third. It didn't remotely even come close to working. Let's take a look at it again. The holder is Jeff Gossett. He's the punter. They try to get it in on a little shovel pass. It's a design play. No chance at all as Charles was there before Griggs was able to get to the football. They might wish they had that back. 12-16 to go in the third period. If you're scoring, as the saying goes, Mike Charles gets an interception. He was so stunned that he been able to keep his feet, he might have rumbled that one all the way to the end zone. Strange call. Marino at the 35-yard line, first and 10. And with Matt Moore in motion, Lorenzo Hampton is the ball carrier. And Hampton takes it out to the 40-yard line. There's a little oddity tonight. Cleveland has been so passing-oriented, and their passing game has dominated. And yet Miami, a team that lives and dies with the pass on offense, has had a, a pretty much balanced attack tonight, more than keeping Cleveland honest with enough rushing. Well, they haven't done it all year because they came into tonight 27 out of 28 running the football, but they have been able to move it. Not Hampton, though. Negative yardage for him. Second down and five. Miami from the 40-yard line. Davenport. And he has a first down as he takes it out to the 48-yard line. It would behoove Miami to mount a long drive, and maybe one of the reasons Shula will try to mount one and keep the ball on the ground a little bit is to keep Kozar off the field. Even though Cleveland's been held to 16 points, Miami is very fortunate it's only 16. 
I think after what Don Shula's been watching all year with his running game, he's he's kind of stunned that it's working. He's been able to get, get good yardage against a pretty healthy Cleveland Brown defense. Marino rolling. And it's Clayton. And they rule him inbounds. After a gain of about six, as Frank Minifield was covering on the play. And it'll be second down. Clayton and Duper were really almost shut out. They had one reception. Clayton had one reception in the playoff game a year ago when the Dolphins won 24-21. Both of them having good nights tonight. Duper had the 24-yard touchdown reception. Clayton with now three receptions. And Keevans at that. Gain of eight. Second down, two. In the 44. Fake draw. Fletcher knocked down. Davenport, the intended receiver, Eddie Johnson, knocked it away. And it's one of the few times tonight we've had a near sack as Clay Matthews came racing in from the blind side. We've had no sacks in the game. And as I say, very few, even remotely possible sacks. Quarterbacks have been very, very well protected. Cleveland uses that defense. They line Matthews up almost as a defensive end. And the offensive line... And Marino will look at him, and they think he's going to drop back into the coverage, but he comes on it. And that time, he almost blindsided Marino. He was just able to get it away. Third and two. And they keep it on the ground, and it's Davenport scrambling and not getting it. They brought Bennett in and lined him up as the tight end. Clancy makes the tackle on the play. And so Davenport... Despite all of the leverage on the left side, there's Bennett in the slot on the left. And you got Hampton leading the way, which is odd for Davenport. The little man leads, and the big man can't get it. This is where the running game in Miami has not been successful tonight. They've come up on several occasions short on the third and short yardage. McNeil back at the 10. And Roby to punt. booming kick and it bounces into the end zone so back it will come to the 20 yard line Roby upset he couldn't keep it from being a touchback 946 to go in the third the Cleveland Browns run their 50th play of the night they have passed 41 times run eight times from the 20 on first down, Curtis Dickey in motion. Fake to Mack. Good protection again. And Kozar hits Weathers over the middle. Weathers out at the 36. And again, Weathers is seeing a lot of action tonight. Because Slaughter injured an ankle early on. And Slaughter, who was their top draft choice coming in the second round, is on the shelf. And thus, Weathers is in there. Watch Weathers again. And he gets away from Judson. Judson, the man for man, because you saw on the play... The blitz by Mark Brown. They were bringing both outside linebackers, and that forced Judson into the one-on-one -on -one situation. And Weathers beat him, and more than that, they picked up again and protected Bernie Kozar. They've been protecting him ever so well tonight. Weathers, who had caught one pass all season, has caught three tonight. Dickey on first down gets two. Second and eight Cleveland at their own 37. 8.50 to go, third period. Browns on top, 16-10. Cleveland almost picking up a first down every time they have a first down. Second and eight, Dickey makes the catch, but he is shy of the first down. No, he doesn't even make the catch, they rule. As they come in for a closer look, Blackwood covering on the play. It'll be third and eight. That's one of the few poorly thrown balls tonight by Kozar. He just did not get his body around, tried to rely totally on his arm, underthrew it, and that 
would have been another Cleveland Brown first down because Dickey put a good move on the cornerback and was there for the yardage. Third and eight, Kozar, as you saw, up and over the 300 figure for the first time in his brief career. And down he goes at the 36, and that'll be the first sack of the game, and it's credited to Doug Betters. They brought Mark Brown. That time, the protection for Kozar fell apart on him, and Betters gets in there. Who has not been starting. He's still perhaps the best pass rusher of the unit. There he is on the inside, coming from that familiar defensive end position. Jeff Gossett to kick, and it's fielded at the 19 by Craig Ellis. And he runs into a storm after a four-yard run back to the 23. 46-yard punt and a minimal return as Gossett comes off the field. And Cleveland maintains a six-point lead with 7.45 to play in the period. Nothing ever changes. The end zone fans here at Cleveland Stadium, they are wild. They are loud. And when you have your offensive team on the field, you come down here, you can't hear a thing, and he doesn't like it. Miami changes off a lot. They'll have a tough time with this noise. First and 10 from the 23-yard line, dumped over the middle to Hampton. Hampton pointing out where the block should be thrown and has a first down. Frank Minifield spills him out at the 33-yard line. A couple of characteristics of this stadium. When you win the toss, I used to hate to win the toss when we played here because you usually would receive, and that meant that you were going to go from the outfield to the infield, and it is genuinely uphill. I mean, major uphill. And you hated to go uphill. And the other thing is you, did, you don't want to get down here near the end zone because... Here are some pretty wild fans here, certainly noisy ones, if not prone to a little bit of violence. Well, I was slightly premature on the first down call, so it's back to the ophthalmologist, second and two inches, which is even better than first down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cleveland. Passing on first down. Cleveland passing more than 80% of the time period tonight. Miami, almost 50-50. Miami has run the ball 17 times and thrown it 19 times. And they have the potential to take the lead on this drive. Marino, 11 of 19, 149 yards, one touchdown, but he just hasn't been out there very much. Second and inches, and Hampton. Picks up enough inches. They pushed him back, but after, I believe, he picks up the first as Carl Hairston makes the tackle. And a flag is down in what has been a relatively penalty-free game. And it's against Miami, so that will negate what would have been a first. Offense number 66. Holding. 10-yard penalty. Still second down. Gene Barth says the guilty party is Larry Lee. Usually when Miami's involved, it is a relatively penalty-free game. Annually, they are low in the league with penalties. It's a bit of a major part of the philosophy of Don Shula. Don't turn it over, don't fumble it, don't throw the interception, and don't get a lot of penalties. Only Miami's second penalty of the night. Second and 11 from the 23. Another flag. And Hampton, and yet another flag. Two separate flags on the play. One at the line of scrimmage and one on the contact. Hampton and Ellis. So two different penalties on the play. One call by the head linesman, one call by the field judge. And Barth wants to hear about them both. Lance and Harrison are saying against the Dolphins, but there are two flags. We have offsetting fouls, holding 56 defense, illegal motion, 79 offense. The waste way to down. Check it down. Banks defense, Giesler, the left tackle offense. Giesler is just back a couple of weeks ago as 
the Dolphins have really been going almost the entire year with a makeshift line, a couple of free agents over on the right side, and all pro in the middle in Stevenson. But Lee is a free agent from Detroit. Cook at right tackle, a free agent from Green Bay. It's been that kind of year for the Dolphins. Multiple injuries. Second and 11 from the 23. Marino dumps it over the middle. Davenport. And he fumbles the ball at the 30 yard line. Cleveland's there. No signal yet. Oh. Minifield comes away with the football, and now the signal to make it official. Chip Banks with the pot. Banks hits Davenport. And Minifield takes the football home with him. They didn't know that he had come out of that pile. Minifield squirted out of that pile with the football. They were still digging to see who had it. Let's take a look at it again. Davenport looks upfield. Banks is there. And there's a tremendous hit by Minifield. As Banks made the tackle, Minifield found the ball right in front of him, eased out of the pile, and the Cleveland Browns get the turnover inside the 30. And so as Davenport and the offense comes away, the Browns take over inside the 30. Another thing you do for Don Shula when you are a ball hand, a wide receiver, running back, or whatever, you don't fumble it very often and stick around. Please put 19 seconds back on. After a, a review of this replay, the call stands. The call stands. Unless they want 19 seconds tacked back on, which will make 6.39 to go in the third period. Please put 19 seconds back on the clock. 19. There's Davenport. Another Louisville ball player. I thought I heard him say, will the 32nd clock operator please put 19 back on? The 32nd clock at the moment shows 13. There's a malfunction in the 32nd clock. We'll keep it on the field. There are 19 seconds left. 19 seconds on the 30 second clock. Okay, so that clears it up. It wasn't the game clock, which stays at 620. And there's a malfunction there on the 30 second clock. And now you've got everything in order, right? Well, and they are going to have to keep the 30-second clock on the field on each and every play or just for this one. We'll find out. This game's going to need John Cameron Swayze pretty soon. We'll keep him busy. First and ten. Langhorn in motion from the 30-yard line. Dickey. Gets about six to the 24. Glenn Blackwood tripped him up. Dickey, the past couple of weeks, has put a lot into the ground game for the Browns. We talked about it earlier, but Ernest Beiner, their 1,000-yard rusher of a year ago, and came in tonight still as the leading rusher and receiver, out for the season with a injured ankle. They could get him back for the playoffs, however. Dickey's the only Brown who's gained more than 100 yards in a game this season. Second and four. Kozar under some pressure. And that's incomplete, and no flag. And you saw the official go not only incomplete, but no, no, no. Mack and Offerdahl with the contact, and the official making two calls. One incomplete, and the other no penalty. Mack trying to slip out underneath. Kozar faking upfield to try to pull Offerdahl off. Mack coming out of the backfield. But this is the rookie we talked about at the beginning of the, of the evening. Has a great future ahead of him, leading in tackles, and has been the one bright spot defensively for Don Shula through the entire year. Third and four from the 24. Goes on. Escapes blindside pressure and hits Brennan. Takes it to the 13 yard line. And the former Boston College wide receiver makes the catch after. Kozlowski, the sixth defensive back, had put the pressure on from the backside on Kozar. Kozar gets away from Kozlowski, reads it, almost smells it, steps up, side arms it in there. That was a tremendous shot to Brennan. And it, once again, just showing the maturity 
of Bernie Kozar, the youngest quarterback in this game today. He won't be 23 until a little more than, well, it's November the 25th. Very much the quintessential Brennan-type catch. He's what's mm -hmm. known as that possession-type receiver, the reach. He's small at 5'9", and makes the grab over the middle. Langhorn in motion on first down from the 13. Nicky, 10-5, yeah. touchdown. They've been bending and bending and stretching and stretching. They just broke. And for Dickey, that one great year with the Colts, and then he comes over here and he backs up two guys who each gained over 1,000, but one's on injured reserve. The other is coming back from an injury, and he's the main man out of the backfield right now. That's great blocking back on the part of Cody Reason. The right tackle, he took out a couple of Dolphins, and this is what has been happening to the Dolphins all year long. You can't write them out of it. Ordinarily, you would if they didn't have the great offense they have. They're down 22, about to be 23-10. But the Dolphins, well, they still have those two wide receivers. They still have Marino. Ordinarily, you'd think you'd have this thing locked up, Al. Dudley and the defense, I guess that's a look he's exhibited all season long. Not many smiles. I'll tell you, this was so wide open that even Curtis Dickey was shocked. He usually stutter steps a little bit. He saw it there. Great block by Reason coming back. An easy touchdown for Curtis Dickey. Curtis Dickey. Big night, 70 yards on the ground, and it's been mainly a passing night for Cleveland, but he's done the job when they've had to carry the ball, and they lead by 13, and the kick comes down to Ellis at the six-yard line. To the 18. Wild special teams on these Cleveland Browns. They take such pride in their work. They have a, also a wild coach that runs along the sidelines with them. Bill Cower. And he has really put the spirit into these special teams for the Browns. And they have been effective all year long. There he is, former Brown linebacker and Philadelphia Eagle linebacker, but he gets into the game. He is a method coach, if you will. Fans are getting into this one, too. There are 80,000 of them here. 4.24 to play in the third. Marino is 12 out of 20 for 157. And now he's 13 of 21 and a first down. Bruce Hardy, the tight end in the game of 13 out of the 31-yard line. Bruce Hardy, ninth year out of Rose Bowl bound Arizona State. I knew you would get around to that. Can I have your tickets? <laughs> SC is going someplace else this year. They have had a great year. Uh huh. First and ten. Dolphins from the 31. Marino and incomplete out at the 46 yard line. Lorenzo Hampton, the intended receiver, second and ten. Hampton played in a Florida backfield that also had Neil Anderson, who was the Bears' number one choice earlier this year. And also John L. Williams of the Seattle Seahawks. So when Charlie Pell was running it, and subsequent to that, Galen Hall at Gainesville, some pretty good talent out of that backfield. Landed down 23-10. If it was anyone else, with a little more than three minutes in the third quarter, you could pretty much write it off. Second and 10, and dropped at the 35-yard line, Davenport. Ray Ellis. One of those who was dropped by Buddy Ryan at Philadelphia. And Ellis has come in, number 24, and done a nice job in place of the injured Al Gross at safety. So nice, in fact, there's some question as to whether Gross is going to get his job back. And he's just about ready to come off by arm. Again, Marino, plenty of time to get the ball out to Davenport. And Ellis is there. Went right through the hands, but Ellis was there, and he has done a great job. Came in late in September after the final cut. Became a starter instantly. It's going to be tough, as you said, Al, to get for Al Gross to get that job back. Pruitt goes in motion on third and ten. And Marino throws complete. He has Duper, and Duper tries for the first down, and I believe he does have it. 
He had to get to the 42, and he gets to the 42 and a half. Again, First down. good pass protection for Marino. Who came, he brought Duper all the way from the far side. You'll see him working against Minifield. Bumps into him a little, bounces off, gets a little bit of a pick there from Minifield's old man, and stretches and reaches, knows where he has to be, and gets the first down. Tough. Man to man against Duper and Clayton. Meanwhile, Minifield has come to the bench. They're working on Frank. And so they have to go to Mark Harper at the corner to the Browns on first down from the 43-yard line. Marino goes deep for Duper, oh. too deep. Covered by Dixon on the play. Oh, he knew he had him. <laughs> Marino looked over, actually looking over to Don Strzok, who's been such a big help to him, this 13-year veteran. Calls a lot of the plays. Look at that protection. It was almost classic. And he had him wide open. He knew it. He had beaten Dixon in a full sprint, and that's one that you would suspect that Marino would hit seven out of ten times. And there's a look at Strzok. He has the orange blazer on. That's so Marino can pick him out, and he'll wigwag the signals in, conferring with Don Shula. As a matter of fact, Don Strzok will call a lot of the plays on his own. Second and ten. Again, Minifield is out of the game at the moment. And they move Harper over to a corner spot. That won't be lost on the Dolphins very long either. And that's picked off at the 42 by Matthews. And thus, even though they were depleted in the secondary, the defense does the job as Matthews, the linebacker, goes back to pick off Marino. Even the best will make a mistake, and Marino made a big one. Threw it right into Matthews. Didn't read the defense properly, and he's so good at it. Either that or Matthews, who's been around a long time, changed up the defense on his own. In any event, he got right in front of Marino as they continue to work on many field on the sidelines. Our word is that he has cramps in the, both calves. And let's take a look. Those people are big in front of Marino. You can see over to the left, there were a lot of big folks in there. He never did see Clay Matthews, who, as I said before, is one of those wily, crafty veterans, and he probably broke, the own, broke his own defense, stepped in there, anticipated it, and got the interception. There he is. There's Matthews. They work on Minifield, and they are also working on Brian Brennan, who has his shoe off, as they attend to Brennan's ankle, the wide receiver. They've already lost Slaughter for the moment, the other wide receiver, or one of them. And that's the Browns, and there is the, the ankle right there being wrapped of Brian Brennan as the offense comes back on the field. Matthews, who got the interception, one of 11 USC linebackers, and we used to talk Penn State when we talked linebackers in the NFL. I knew you'd get that in there. Uh, <laughs> now, pretty much dominated by linebackers out of USC. Uh, got him on either corner for the Cleveland Browns. Chip Banks, of course, an All-American out there. Matthews, maybe not as celebrated as Banks, but a very fine linebacker on the other side. First down, Cleveland from the 47. And even with two wide receivers on the bench, they still go to the air. And Langhorn makes the catch and fights to the 46-yard line for a gain of seven. 2.17 to play, third period. Cleveland on top, 23-10. That's Fontenot making the catch. Herman Fontenot. And again, just to note, for the Miami Dolphins, they lose this one tonight. Any playoff hopes they might have had are pretty much out the window as there will be a lot of wild card contenders. We looked at them a little earlier, but it could just about end the Miami Dolphins' hopes. And, of course, it will put the Cleveland Browns one up in the Central Division of the AFC. Greer comes in motion as he gets in for the first time tonight, and Dickey gets stopped at the 47-yard line. Doug Betters wraps him up. You saw number 80 in motion for Cleveland. Terry Greer, who was just reactivated out of the Canadian Football League. And thus he is in at one wide out spot. The Browns, you'll recall, last year had a lot of trouble. Their wide receivers caught fewer passes than any other team's wide outs. And so they went to the draft into Canada to try to shore it up. Brian Brennan was their top wide out, 35 receptions. Third down and four from the 47, and Fontenot 
first down inside the 40 and Fontenot to the 30-yard line. And so with the flow going the other way to the right side, the Browns run it back to the left, and Fontenot picks up the first. This is certainly not dull offense, and Herman Fontenot out of LSU has given the Browns a lot of different dimensions. He was a wide receiver and a running back at LSU. He can do a little bit of both. Last week, he had a 72-yard touchdown pass against the Colts. They got him as a free agent, just overlooked in the draft, and he can do many things for these Browns. You saw Kozlowski, the extra defensive back, go limping off. First and 10 at the 31-yard line. Kozar over the middle to Dickey to the 22-yard line goes Curtis for a 9-yard game. He's still cute, Curtis Dickey, now in his seventh year. Good little move. And the second move got the first down as we went out of time in the third quarter as the Browns fans come to their feet. 80,000 in one hand. They get an ovation. They have dominated thus far. But it's still Miami. It might not be over. We'll be back after this from our station. Cleveland Stadium, Cleveland, Ohio. Al Michaels, Frank Gifford. We start the fourth quarter. Don Shula still hopeful his team can stay alive as they dream about a wild card berth, but that dream's turning into a nightmare. Second down and one as we start the fourth period for Cleveland at the Miami 21-yard line. And it's Mack picking his way for a first down to the 15. And a defense out that we knew was more than suspect is now just being shredded. Cleveland just rolling it up. Total yards approaching the 500-yard mark, even though it's not reflected in a whole lot of points. They've been totally dominant. Miami always, you must be aware, can come back with the big bomb, but how long can they live by that? They've got to, at some point, perform defensively. First and 10 from the 15-yard line. Dickey. Run out of bounds at the 9-yard line. Second and four. Jackie Ship and Bud Brown in on the stop. For Don Shula, he's going to be in a position, if he doesn't win this one, to see his team four and six, to see them five games out of first place in the AFC East. To see them three games back of New England with the Patriots in second. And Al doesn't hurt in 24 years as a head coach. He's had one losing season. He takes this serious. Second down, four. At the nine-yard line. Stopped after a gain of two. We talked about it earlier. The Dolphins knew coming into the season. There were indications last year they had defensive problems. They had that one dry spell early on, came on at the end, and then, of course, lost in the AFC Championship game to New England. But they knew going in they had defensive problems, but they didn't know they'd be this severe. They were a little ill last year. Actually, it started to get that way late in 84. And San Francisco exposed them considerably in the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 19. And they got really sick last year, and then they made a couple of trades. One of them was Hugh Green. They lost him earlier in the year. He was to be their pass rusher. And they lost a couple of other players, and the defense has just fallen apart. On third and three, it's Fontenot carrying for a first down as he takes it to the four. And Frank talking about Fontenot, the versatile one. He played for Kurt Schottenheimer, an assistant coach at LSU, and if the name is familiar, that's Marty's brother. So Marty knew all about this man. Under Bill Arnsparger, who used to be the defensive coach for Don Shula. Very incestuous game we have. <laughs> First and goal, Cleveland. 12.55 to play in the fourth. Browns would be 7-3, and three, and the game in front of Cincy with a win. One thing, the Browns... Dolphins are going to have a tough time doing, mending their defense. They gave away their number one draft pick to get Hugh Green. They gave away a number two pick to get him. Mack, flag thrown. He's in momentarily for the score, but let's see about the call. Jack 
Gene Barth tells us. Holding 81 offense. 10 yards penalty, we'll replay the now. Harry Holt, well, he's been involved in everything tonight. He has scored a touchdown and cost them one. They have a commanding lead, 23 to 10, and you have to think back early what it might have been had there not been a couple of drop passes, a fumble early in the first quarter. This could have been a route early in the game, but the Dolphins have stayed in it. They still are in it because they are so explosive offensively. But they have really been exposed defensively tonight. This is going to be a long remainder of the season for them. First and goal from the 14. Langhorn in motion. Kozar throwing. Langhorn takes it to the six. I love it pretty. One thing, and it, it's been so evident tonight, the Dolphins have no pass rush. Zero. Take a look at it again. Pretty little move. Again, Kozar all the time he needed. Looked over a couple of receivers. Finally discovered Langhorn. He gets about a 9.9 .9 on that. And gets it back down inside the six-yard line. Second and goal. Kozar 29 of 47 to 364 yards. Brennan's back in the game. He's in the slot. Dumped off for a touchdown. Mack. When you're hot, you're hot. And now, Kozar is being told he's been in the grass. Huh. Unbelievably told he was in the grass. According to Barth, what grass? They do it to protect them. I got to see this. That was quick. Here it is again. Kozar in a lot of trouble. Again, he's not pretty, but somehow you don't get him down. He was like this in Miami. He moves around back there. He's not quick. Pulls it down, and he's always able to get the football loose some way. That's... Say what? Offendahl, who had some kind of a grasp. <laughs> it was a brief one, to say the least. But the rule is there to protect the quarterback, and every now and then you're going to get that quick whistle. Third down and goal. Bad call. Fontenot. To the four. Funny how Cleveland has self-destructed so often tonight on their way into the end zone. They've already had a touchdown call. They've actually had two touchdowns called back on this drive. One on Holt's call. The other on the dubious in the grass call. And now they have to settle for a field goal. And then they had Slaughter fumble the ball out of the end zone in the first quarter. Hardly a grass, though, Al. It was just a quick whistle and that little apprehension on the part of the official. And again, it does cost them the touchdown. They tried out the field goal unit, Matt Barr. Barr with Gossett holding 21-yard field goal. And the kick is good. That does put them beyond two touchdowns, however, and they can breathe a little sigh of relief. The Duper and Clayton and Marino are still out there. Bernie Kozar, look at that, 366 yards, and he may be on the verge of some history. <laughs> 80 400-yard passing games in NFL history. 80, but never one in which the quarterback did not throw a touchdown pass. He's on his way. If you think about it, it's hard to do. Yeah. He's had one call back. Short kick by Barr, fielded up at the 20-yard line by Ellis. And he fights his way out to the 34. So Marino and the Dolphins, who have been limited to 10 points tonight by a Cleveland defense that has been erratic, but pretty good, all things considered, this year. Looking down the line for Cleveland, this Sunday they will be at the Raiders. Then it really lightens up for them. They have Pittsburgh, then they have Houston, Buffalo, Cincinnati, and San Diego. They're not all barn burners there. The Cincinnati, of course, will be tough. Cincinnati, however, will play Seattle, Minnesota, Denver, New England, and the Cleveland game. Then they have the Jets. Mm. That's tough. So a much, much tougher schedule for Cincinnati. Cleveland will really be in great shape if they win this one. Marino from the 34 hits Tony Nathan. And Nathan, who's been relatively silent tonight, takes it out to the 46-yard line, Ray Ellis. 
He was a big man in the playoff game a year ago. Ten receptions for Nathan out of the backfield as they covered Duper and Clayton fairly well there. Only one reception to the two marks. Meanwhile, they go to the hurry-up offense, which they have to do with 9.50 to go because they're down by more than two TDs. And the pass is caught by Clayton, and he takes it to the 35-yard line. And so Miami with a first and 10, and Marino shoving the rest of the offense downfield, saying, let's go, let's go. No huddle. When they get it in there, they can really move it. And again, Minifield is not in the game. He is still not in there, even though he was loosening up. And Cleveland wants a timeout. So the Browns are forced to use a timeout minus Minifield and the rest because of the hurry-up Miami offense. 9.33 to go in the fourth. Minifield, whom we were told was cramping up early on, is still being worked on. Cleveland had to take a timeout defensively to get things in order. And Miami has a first and 10 at the 35-yard line. Cleveland on top by 16. Marino under pressure for one of the rare times tonight as Chip Banks blitz second down. And Marino has a few words for Banks. Friendly words, sort of. Marino also could have drawn a flag. He just dumped that off. There wasn't a dolphin in the area. Take a look at it again. Nathan, Nathan moved to the inside. I, I would suspect that when they look at the game films, they're going to say, Nathan, that's a good way to eliminate our quarterback. Banks just with a clean path all the way to Marino. Second and ten. And it's Hardy, the tight end, to the 30-yard line. Stopped by Ellis. So Don Shula, who is the subject of rumors and some concern as to what will happen with him watching his team now. Don, in the final year of his contract at Miami, he's been there since 70. It's a subject he's been asked about, and you asked him about it on tape earlier, Frank, and he doesn't want to discuss it, and he didn't want to discuss it privately either today. No, he just said, so frankly, we've had problems in the past. We've always been able to work it out, and let's face it. This is his 17th year there. Third and five, and Marino going deep and looks for Pruitt, and incomplete. And Pruitt looks for a flag and doesn't get it. Wrapped up by Dede Hoggers. Look at it again. Hoggard right up there in the face of Pruitt, the rookie out of Cal State Fullerton, who has looked awfully good this year. He had... A little bit of a step, and Marino just threw that a little shorter. That could have been six. Took quite a shot on the head, too. Hoggard once again coming back, and could well have drawn a flag after the fact. Meanwhile, Ellis, 24 at the end of that play, was shaken up, and he now comes out. So they're missing Ellis. They're missing Minifield at the moment. Those are two starters. Gross is still on injured reserve. Marino has a depleted secondary to pick on, but he has to pick up five here on fourth and five. Felix Wright comes in to replace Ellis. This could be your playoff. And on fourth and five, Marino uh, can't believe it. He went for a long count. Ball start, number 13 offense, five yards from it. He went for the long count, and it was his own man who came up with the false start. That'll give us a fourth down and ten for the Dolphins. Won't change anything. They still have to go for it. It just changes what you're going to go with. Fourth and ten at the 35 of the Browns. 8.40 to go in the fourth. 26-10 Cleveland. The, the two marks will get a lot of attention. Matt Moore, number 89, with a single coverage. And Marino throws an incomplete on a curious pass anyway because had Moore made the catch, he wouldn't have had the first down. Mark Harper was right there with him. So catch or no catch, they wouldn't have gotten the first. 
Good read by Marino. And you're right, Nat Moore didn't take it up far enough. And good coverage by Mark Harper. 8.35 remaining, and the Browns dominating. They've been able to hold on to the football, and that's what they're going to concentrate right at the moment. They want to take some time off the scoreboard clock, and they've been able to move the ball and do that. Bernie Kozar and the best night of his very young career. And going to the air 25 times on first down. That wasn't not by happenstance. They opened the game that way, and they have stayed with it. From the 35-yard line, Langhorn goes in motion. And now they'll try to take some time off the clock, and they begin with Kevin Mack picking up about three. We were talking about Don Shula, Frank. One of the rumors about Shula has him maybe going to Tampa Bay and maybe picking up a part of that franchise. No pun intended. Would that be tampering? Absolutely, it would be tampering. <laughs> <laughs> he pointed that out today. He said, I'm under contract. I don't think there's anything to it, quite frankly, because Don Shula has always had little run-ins with Joe Robbie. There's been kind of an adversarial thing between the two of them since the day he got there, but he's also produced a lot of Super Bowls, a lot of winning seasons, 13 division titles, or at least a tie for it in the past 16 years. They have a great deal of respect for each other, and I think, like Don Shula, I'm quite sure they're going to work something out, and the rest of it, I think, is just a lot of talk. Matt. All he cares about now is staying in bounds, and he accomplishes that because it keeps the clock running. We're down to seven and a half. Now, the last time Don Shula was up for a contract negotiation, I think everyone had him coming to the New York Giants. And it seems like every time a contract is up, of course, a legend, really in his own time, Don Shula, there's going to be speculation that he might be moving on somewhere else. But he might come out with a losing season and defensive problems, but I'd still like to be his agent. Mm. New stadium going up that opens next August the 16th before a nationally televised audience down in Miami. Third and seven from the 38-yard line as Kozar throws complete. Brennan uh, makes the catch and picks up the first down. Saw yeah. where the marker was. Actually, it is officially measured from the other side of the field. This is where the official chain is. And then, of course, they have that little stripe down there, which sort of indicates, so it's not official. So Brennan was there, but it is now official as Barth takes a better look. But you could have a case where if that thing isn't exactly lined up with the official marking, where you think you've got the first, but you really don't. There's Brennan. He was just timing it out, working behind... The other receiver getting just enough yards to get it out of bounds and step across that first down marker. And the Browns maintain possession. They're working on the clock. 46-yard line. And with Langhorn in motion, they give it to Dickey, who's had a nice night. He picks up a couple out to the 47. 6.45 to play in the fourth. I know already the drawing board is out for Don Shula. Like I say, this is just about wipes out any playoff hopes they have. What do you do with it? Bob Baumauer coming back just a couple of weeks ago, still troubled from knee surgery during the offseason. George Little starting over the right side where Kim Bocamper started a year ago. G.J. Turner, a rookie from Houston, starting on the left side, the head of Doug Petters. They gave away the number one draft pick to get Hugh Green, who is questionable whether he'll be able to come back next year. It's a tough road to rebuild this defense, no matter what they do. Dickey flag out to the 49 he goes and it goes against the Browns Marty Schottenheimer meanwhile quietly and he is uh, not one of the more what you'd call a bullion coaches in the league he's a guy who doesn't really make for the type of interview or the type of quotes that get picked up nationally though he is showing a little ire here Holding. He must have heard you. Yeah. <laughs> refused. Third down. He's not normally demonstrative, unless not many people know too much about Schottenheimer, but quietly and solidly, he's got a team that's going to be 7-3 and three very shortly. He's been around a little bit. He played in the AFL. He played up at Boston. He later worked around the league and went into coaching with Detroit. Later, with the New York Giants in 77, then went up to Detroit, and then came here in 1979 and took 
over for Sam Matigliano midseason in 1985 or 84. Third and seven, and his movement again. So all of a sudden, the Browns start having some problems with penalties as Paul Farron was the man who jumped 74. Ball start, 74 offense, five yard penalty, still third down. Tell you what else Marty Schottenheimer did. He decided the defense that they went with last year was not going to get it done, so he brought in Lindy and Fatty, who he had worked with at the Giants in 1977. Lindy and Fatty was with Cincinnati when they went to the Super Bowl in 81. He believes in integrating the pass and the run, whereas the Browns were almost totally a running team, running oriented a year ago. And I think really this might be their best showing thus far of the season, albeit against a defense that is one of the weakest we've seen this year. Third down and 12, and Kozar to throw. And to Fontenot, but he gets it to the only the 46-yard line, so he's shy of the first down. And the Browns looking over toward Schottenheimer to see what the decision is as to whether they want to punt or go for it. And the way their offense has been going tonight, they're almost a, a lock cinch to pick up the first. And they'll go for it. That's what I mentioned earlier. When you are moving a football against a defense like this, and this is one of the problems you have when you have a weak defense. The team is not afraid to come out there and go on fourth and one. Earlier in the game, they scored on a 16-yard reverse on a third down and one. And they knew if they didn't get it, they still have another opportunity. So here they are, fourth and one, quite confident that they'll be able to pick it up. <laughs> Miami's trying to give it to them. Well, that's it. Boy, I tell you, if this goes against Miami, that'll really sum it up, won't it? But Barth says, hold on. Were they drawn off? And the answer is, as Art Fleming used to say, on Jeopardy. And the answer is, Encroachment, number 71 defense. Yep, they gave it to him. Doesn't that figure? Boy, that's all Shulman needed. That's all he needed. First down Cleveland without a whimper. Mike Charles was the guy, a man who's been suspended, who's been on injured reserve. And now the line judge, who is Jack Johnson, explaining it to Shula. Don will take a loss, but he hates to have it sloppy. And he can get leather exercise. First and ten, Cleveland at the 41-yard line. Langhorn in motion. Dickey for a couple. Frank, I've been wondering all year, can I take this game and show it for profit somewhere? No, because the National Football League says any use of this telecast without their express written consent is strictly prohibited. So don't do it. All right. You like that lead into the disclaimer? Mm, it shortens it up, too. <laughs> it does. I'm going to put music to that. It'd be a lot more effective. <laughs> little bells and a little chimes as we get to the holiday season. <laughs> How many times I've read that thing? <laughs> Maybe 300? No one's ever tried to use it. Second down and eight from the 39-yard line. Gain of five for Mack. Sometimes local teams read that disclaimer, and there's a, another line that says, and the announcers are subject to approval by the team. I used to work with Lon Simmons on the San Francisco Giants games. Lon used to do the 49ers radio. He always used to finish that line by saying, at gunpoint. <laughs> Were you approved? <laughs> right. <laughs> CFA college football, Penn State against Notre Dame, or Texas A&M taking on Arkansas Saturday. College football coverage beginning at 3 Eastern time. Hey, and uh, Monday night will be in the nation's capital. Joe Montana and the 49ers. Roger Craig, all those dudes. Dwight Park. And this the Red Hot Redskins team tied with the Giants in the NFC East. Third and five, and Kevin Mack gets the first down. And Kozar may have just gone over the 400-yard mark. We're going to get the official reading in a minute. Remember, he's trying to become the first quarterback in history. Well, not trying, well, but he would be. He would be the first in history to gain more than 400 yards in the air and not throw a touchdown pass. And gang, he has 401. And there have been 80 guys, 80 QBs who've thrown for 400 yards, or it's been done 80 times. He and probably won't throw it either. But you... 
and if he finds out that he could be in the record book for not throwing the touchdown, going over 400, he might go for it. That 401 is unofficial, and now it's official. 17-yard line, and the first carry of the night for Major Everett, who was recently picked up, free agent. He was waived in training camp by the Eagles. Everybody was waived in training camp by the Eagles. But he would have waved himself if he could. Yeah. 33 is the team record for completion, so he's close to that. And we're at the two-minute warning. And it's been a big night for the sellout crowd by the lake. We've watched him against the Dolphin defense, but you get the feeling about Bernie Gozar, you're going to see a lot of great games. He's young, as we mentioned. He'll be 23 years old, November the 25th. He's a little awkward, a little slow back there. But, man, he is effective. What Miami did was take a timeout defensively before the two-minute warning to stop the clock. So they have two timeouts remaining as they do whatever they can to try to remain in the game. But, that uh, decision, by the way, I'm kind of curious. Went with their defense. They let about 17 seconds run off before they did it. Those are the seconds that they were trying to save. Exactly. Confusion as to whether or not to call it. Second and seven. Brennan in motion. And <laughs> Dickey. Cleveland is going to go to seven and three. They'll have a game up on Cincinnati at six and four. The Steelers three seven. Houston two and eight. And for Miami, they are going to go at four and six with a long road to go for the remainder of this season. 156 to play in the game, so the two minute warning comes here. Third down and one. Cleveland at the seven yard line. It's the third time in the history of the Browns a quarterback has thrown for 400 or more yards in a game. Brian Seif did it, and Otto Graham did it. And now, Kozar. And the record is 444 by Sipe against the Baltimore Colts in 81. Dickey has the first down as he takes it to the two, and a penalty marker goes down. Meanwhile, as if the Dolphins didn't have enough bad things happen to him tonight, Offerdahl, the good young linebacker, is having his wrist x-rayed. And Bob Baumauer went out earlier. I think we understand a pulled groin muscle. He has not come back. Holding 81 offense, 10-yard penalty. Will we play the third down? It's Harry Holt, and Holt called before, cost them a touchdown. What a night for Holt. Scored a touchdown on the end around, the first time he handled the ball this season, either receiving or rushing. And then he's had a touchdown called back and a first and goal called back on penalties. There it is, Seif at 444. Graham back in 52 and Kozar tonight. I remember watching Autogram in 52 with his 401. Our highlights were black and white in those days. Meanwhile, on third down and 11, Vicky takes it to the 12 yard line. And it will be fourth down. Fourth and about five. And the clock has been stopped here by Miami. Miami, Miami second timeout. And now we talked about uh, the schedule of Cincinnati being so much tougher than that of Cleveland. Well, Miami's not easy. Next Sunday they're at Buffalo. Then they're home November the 24th for a game we'll do against the Jets. Then they go against Atlanta at home. Then they have New Orleans. New Orleans, of course, knocked off the Rams. Then December the 22nd, they have New England at home. A game will also do. Kozar, again, coming in tonight, he was having what you call a, a good year. Not great, not spectacular. Their offense had been spurting. Their running game had not been good. And Bernie had some decent days and some mediocre days. But tonight, he's able to shred the Miami secondary. He has the night of his 
young career. And Matt Barr comes in to attempt a fifth field goal, which would tie him with Don Cockroft for the Cleveland team record. Cockroft did it in 75 against Denver. And with Gossett holding, Barr has this one blocked. And so Cockroft can breathe a sigh of relief. Betters blocks it. So it's still 26 to 10 on a night on which the Browns could well have had 50 points. Here it is again, Doug Betters, who's played well tonight. Diving a tip there by Langford. I think he was the one that got the hand on it. Coming around the horn, and Miami gets it back one more time. And we know where they're going to go. They're going to go up top side. Cooper left. And bring the rookie out to the right. That would be Pruitt. Clayton's inside. And Marino out of the shotgun. Throwing, and that's complete. And Tony Nathan takes the ball out to the 34-yard line. They have one timeout remaining. Miami is going to be four and six. And in deepest, darkest third place in the AFC East, Cleveland's going to be seven and three and atop the AFC Central. And Marino to Duper. And all this does is looks good on the stat sheet. Dixon makes the tackle, and we've got a minute to play in the game. And Kozar has prevailed. He got through a 400 yard game without throwing the touchdown pass. Interesting little note of the record book. Yeah. Fascinating note when you think about it. Like I said earlier, it's hard to do. Eight and first time. Clayton, and he has a first down at the 41. Look at somewhere along the line. He's going to throw for 400 yards. Somebody's going to fall into the end zone. And as usual, our thanks up here, George Hill, our statistician. And busy tonight. Malibu Kelly Hayes, another busy man, our spotter, non Perel. From the 41-yard line as Marino throws and incomplete. Intended for Mark Clayton, and that stops the clock for 21 seconds. Tonight on Nightline, inside the National Security Council, one of America's most powerful and secret instruments of foreign policy. Some say it's being used to circumvent Congress and the law, and that's the subject tonight on Nightline. Following your late local news. Offerdahl. And we were told he went back for x-rays on his wrist. An ice bag on the elbow. Well, it's been that kind of year for the defensive unit of the Dolphins. Second and ten as Marino hits Duper. And then Duper tries to lateral it off to Nathan and he goes out of bounds. And it's funny, because of a drive like this and a defense playing so soft, you look in the paper tomorrow and you see the type of night that some receivers have had, and you say, hey, not bad. And then you don't realize it's like garbage time in the NBA. Mm. One of the great ones right there. You just have got to get the football back to him. Twelve seconds to go. Cleveland ahead by 16. Marino throws it up, and Pruitt can't come down with it. Pruitt leaping but sandwiched. And Hoggins said, hey, man, I'm just doing my job here. And Marino was Barry just as he released the ball. Look at it again from the shotgun by his good, uh, his great and good buddy Pizzuli, one of your dear friends. Pizzuli has been hot over the last few weeks. It really goes back to when they started to use a four man line, featuring a four man line. They would bring Pizzuli in at defensive tackle. He plays there perhaps better than he, or rather, defensive end. And he has just been as hot as he can be. That's six sacks overall, four in the last four games. Flag thrown. And it's Clayton, and he gets in for a touchdown. Clayton goes in. There was a flag, I believe, one of the 
Browns had jumped offside. Dolphins lost to the Raiders. 91 defense was offside. Touchdown counts. And we'll kick the extra point. Clancy was offside. Funny, the Dolphins lost to the Raiders 30 to 28. No time remaining on the clock. And on the last play of that game, Clayton scored a touchdown. On a 68-yard reception as the game ended. So another meaningless touchdown. And again, that score, Al, is going to be very interesting. Much closer than this game yeah. ever was. Going to be a nine-point game, and it could have been a 30-point game. Block, and then it hits the upright. And for Miami, I suppose it should end like that, right? Marino winds up 22 of 39 for 294. Two touchdowns, but Kozar has the night of his pro life. There'll be more. And Cleveland is now 7-3 and three and with a much softer schedule than Cincinnati and a one-game lead in the AFC Central. And for Don Shula, the type of season he has rarely, if ever, experienced. Certainly not in his days in Miami. Trip home and then back to Buffalo and... They'll play out the string with a mark of four and six. Al Michaels, Frank Gifford, that's the story from Cleveland where the Browns beat the Dolphins 26 to 16. And this ABC Sports exclusive has been brought to you by Miller Lite. For a great taste, there's only one light beer. By Renault Jeep, where commitment to quality and innovation form a winning team. By Minolta, creator of the incredible Maxim Autofocus SLR system, only from the mind of Minolta. And by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Never matters how far you go, Goodyear takes you home. Travel arrangements made through. Promotional fee paid by United Airlines. United flies more people to Hawaii than any other airline. Nobody knows Hawaii like United. And this has been a presentation of ABC Sports, recognized around the planet as the leader in sports television.